So let's start where we always start, the numbers. Fellow Kenyans, in the last 24 hours? 307 cases in Kenya yesterday, the highest number recorded so far. Mm -hmm. And what is worrying the Ministry of Health is that this number was not from the... Um, from specifically the highest number of, of, of samples countrywide. It was from a specific target of 3,500 tests that were done in, in, um, in certain areas. And from this 3,500, they've gotten 307 positive cases. The Ministry of Health is now worried Why? about this because mm. it is from a particular sample in a particular area. Um, I thought and that's what they've been doing all along. They've been no. getting particular samples from particular areas. No, but now what they're saying is that from this one mm. of 3,500, this one particular area, they're not giving the exact details, but from this exactly, they got the 307. Um, whereas previously, in the highest number of cases that they've ever, in the highest number of tests that they've ever done, which was 6,027, the highest number that they've been able to get from that number was 213. Now, from 3,500, they've gotten 307. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So they're saying on the test that they did in a particular day, 3,500, they've gotten 307. When they did much higher than that, they only got 213. So... What they're saying now is that it is clear to them and that should be clear to everybody that Corona <coughs> is now deep in the country. And number two, they're expecting it to be across all 47 counties in a short period of time where currently it's only at 41. Yeah, I don't think it's at 41. What? You think it's at 47? Yes, it has been at 47. I mean, this thing, until it can be shown that when the testing has increased, so have the numbers, mm. then we will simply say that, you know something, that may actually be true. Mm. But if there's a corresponding increase in the numbers who test positive, even the word, remember the word test, mm. we don't have a case like with HIV where people volunteer to be tested. We haven't got to that stage where people can actually go and just walk in and get tested. Mm -hmm. The government seems to be the one making the initiative to test. Mm -hmm. So, if the other six, the government has made initiatives and has taken steps to test people and they have tested and still there are no positives, then that should be stated clearly. Mm. Okay. So if you look at that percent, 3,519, right? Um, and 307 test positive that's about about eight percent mm -hmm. but if you if you look at our totals how many have we how many we've done 173,355 total samples tested mm -hmm. not people tested right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and out of those we have 6,673 mm -hmm. testing positive it comes to about four percent mm -hmm. so about four percent of all the samples tested um have Turn, have returned a positive result. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what is the spike now? I, I'm still not, uh, unless, maybe what I needed is just a bit more information of, we went and tested this particular area. Mm -hmm. Previously, when we tested in this particular area, this is the kind of number that we got. Mm -hmm. We went back to the same, same area, same, um, uh, what word was uh, Professor Anzala using? Okay, same uh, group of people. And now we are seeing a higher, a rising number of positive cases mm -hmm. emerging. Then I would say, so I, I don't know. Well, I guess th for, the, for them, a cause of concern is the cause of, of concern. Mm. Amongst the numbers tested, they've mm. never, they have, it's not been realized that it would be um, this high mm. compared to the number of samples tested. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So yeah. for them, it's an element of concern mm. because it has never been this high in terms of numbers recorded. And then when you do a comparison to the numbers tested on a whole, then this is the highest. So, you know, according to what they're saying, this is a. Uh, a, a highest cases in a day dull hopes for the ease of measures because they expect to see these numbers rise. Mm. Okay. So the story still continues. It's about ease of numbers. I mean, ease of the measures, measures. and all. So it's a build up to that. Anyway, we'll have that conversation as we um, continue with this show mm -hmm. on what we expect to hear from the president come Monday. Right. 
Around the world, however, the numbers continue to rise. We said that we will probably see um, the world hit 11 million by the weekend, and it's highly probable that this will happen. With the shooting up of uh, cases uh, around the world, it's likely. Currently at 10,803,599, with about 520,000 deaths around the world. Almost 6 million have recovered from this. So you have active cases of about 4.3 million and closed cases, either that would have resulted in death or recovery, at 6.4 million. All right. Um, Mexico still continues to see high numbers, and now well over 10% of those numbers that have been tested positive have resulted in death. 5,681 cases recorded in the last eight hours now, with 741 deaths. Um, so they're looking about 12% of new cases being tested positive, resulting in in death 2.7 million close to 2.8 million cases in the United States with 130,000 deaths so far some states recording you know huge crazy figures in terms of positive cases um now um and some of the numbers that they were giving yesterday is that basically now one in about every three people that you come in contact with is likely to be positive mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yeah, so we continue to see the surge of numbers in southern and south, um, um, in southern and central America, and uh, more cases being recorded in countries like Australia, with uh, eighty-one new cases in the last six hours. Mm. It seems that everything else just, you know, seems to be growing steadily. Now the African continent is upwards of four hundred thousand cases. And um, the numbers continue to rise. With South Africa, um, a, a bulk of those cases now, um, the numbers most recently coming out of South Africa is 159,333 with 2,749 deaths. What's happening in New Zealand? Are they still... Um, Right, so New Zealand hasn't recorded any new cases um, in the last couple of days, um, except until yesterday. So now there are two new cases yesterday, um, bringing the number now of total cases to 1,530. So what they see is a reintroduction of community transmission. Mm. Uh, still very low, but again, it's still quite, um, you know, um, alarming for them, whereas they had come from a place where they had been deco uh, declared COVID-free. So they're looking at an average of about two cases per day, mm. with the last two cases having been recorded in the last six hours. And they made this announcement, um, their day is coming to an end, so they made this announcement at the end of the Thursday, which is what we're just starting today. Okay. Hey, COVID-19. Mm-hmm. And and the numbers increasing, and then you you know getting to that stage where you 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 either know directly know somebody who's uh, uh, affected by COVID. This is in terms of somebody who's actually passed away uh, from COVID, or you know someone who knows mm -hmm. someone who closely knows somebody who has passed away. And it's it's now becoming more of a, um, a community story. Yep. You know, before this, we were like, have you heard anyone? Do you know any of these cases? Do you know now you're getting to a point where you actually get to know them um, personally? So talk about the measures in place. We are doing, uh, getting into a quick break where we look at the weather and then come out of that. And we'll be looking at the newspaper headlines. For a chance to win a thousand shillings worth of free Safaricom airtime, this is what we require you to do. Just from your Safaricom mobile dial star 550 star 2 hash. For 20 shillings worth of airtime, you'll be able to read the standard newspaper. You don't need to download any app, no need to fill up any form, no need to worry about having data bundles. So with that, you'll read the newspaper. When you get your, stan your standard newspaper, go to page two. There are two stories on page two today. One is about the embattled CJ Maraga, and the other is what I want you to tell us about. What is the second story on the standard this morning? What's a headline and what is it about? The headline and what is that story about? There are only two stories in the standard this morning on page two. And what do you tell us? The second story, not the CJ Maraga one. Good morning, 16 minutes after six.
It's likely to be a mostly cloudy day in Nairobi today, currently at 14 degrees. We'll see highs of 23. However, the clouds will be quite low and dark and heavy today in Nairobi. It's also cloudy in Nyeri at 13 degrees. Chance of rains coming in later, highs of 21. And in Nakuru at 13 degrees, it will be mostly cloudy. We'll see the highest temperature at 23 today with a chance of rains later on. Eldoret also is cloudy. It seems that it's the darkness being pulled over Kenya today. 21 degrees and thunderstorms later in the afternoon. Afternoon. Kisumu at 17 degrees is mostly cloudy. We'll see highs of 27 today. And um, <clears throat> taking a look into Kakamega where it's cloudy conditions at 16 degrees and the heavens will open up in a short while with highs of 24 through the day. All right, let's take a look into Mombasa where the rains have already started coming down at 24. We'll see highs of 28 and lows of 23. Malindi at 26 degrees is mostly cloudy, highs of 28 and lows of 24 with showers expected later on. All right, out of Kenya and into Kampala where at 19 degrees is mostly cloudy. It'll change later where we'll see rains come down with highs of 26 and lows of 19. Dar es Salaam is clear this morning at 22. We'll see highs of 31 and lows of 20. 21 later on. It's six degrees, a little bit warmer in Johannesburg today. Clear skies and periodic clouds, but mostly sunny conditions with highs of 18 and lows of four. Lagos at 25 degrees is clear for now. Thunderstorms are predicted for later. Highs of 29 and lows of 24 is what the forecast reads. In Paris, cloudy conditions at 17 degrees. It'll open up just a little bit. I'm going to partly cloudy conditions later with highs of 22 and lows of 13. It's a bit chilly by summer standards in London this morning at 13. See highs of 21 and lows of 12 with showers forecasted for the afternoon. And finally, in New York, where it's still Thursday, Wednesday night, it's clear skies at 23 degrees. We'll see highs of 24 and lows of 21 through Thursday. is Eric Latif Nduoko and C.T. Muga with today's proverb. Today's proverb, <clears throat> West Africa, mm. the Igbo community, the grasshopper which was killed by the locust must be deaf. Let me repeat it. The grasshopper <laughs> which was killed by the locust must be deaf. Didn't hear the, the, grass, the locust flying. You have what got it. it. A fluttering of the wings mm. is loud. So grasshoppers and locusts fight. Dalili ya mvua ni mawingu. Ah, I see. If you heard it coming, if you didn't hear, if you didn't hear it and take heed, then it's your mm. fault. Mm. Mawingu ya metanda. Mm -hmm. Tsunami na kuja. Mm -hmm. Kotayari. Tsunami naenda kanan. Tsunami na kuja. Naenda kanan. <laughs> okay, here's your chance to read a thousand shillings worth of Safaricom airtime. Um, from your Safaricom mobile, you can read the standard newspaper star 550 star 2 hash. That's star 550 star 2 hash. Once you get to the standard, go to page two. There are two stories in the standard today on page two. One is, I'll be out of here soon, embattled Maraga declares. And then the other second story is what I want you to tell us. What is the headline of that story and what's the story about? What's the headline of that story and what is it about? 0719-012-600. You've got between now and 7 o'clock. Stand a chance to win a thousand shillings worth of airtime if you actually give us the correct answer to this. Okay, already calls coming in. Kevin in Machakos, good morning. Good morning to Eric. How are you? Fine, and you? Salama kabisa. Machakos mumemuka salama? Machakos. Salama, tunanalea pua na Governor Alfred Mutua. Very good. <laughs> now, um, have you downloaded the standard newspaper on your, onto your phone? Yeah, nikona kwa simu sai. Okay, what is this second story on uh, on uh, page two of the standard? Uh, inasema, same as Senator's fight of a committee post. And what is the story about? Uh, it's about a 
Senator Beatrice Kwamboka and his um yes. they were fighting over uh vice chair for health committee post. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it said they exchanged blows and uh, uh, parliamentary security separated them. They actually exchanged blows. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, congratulations. Well done. You get it right. Okay. That's the story in the, okay. the second story in the page two of the standard this morning. Congratulations. You win a thousand shillings worth of free safari come time. Just speak to our producer, John. Uh, hold on the line and we'll pick your details, okay? Uh, thank you, Eric. Well done. That's how you get to read the standard newspaper these days. You just need 20 shillings, your uh, mobile phone, dial star 550 star 2 hash. It will cost you 20 shillings worth of airtime. That's it. Okay, just bouncing off that story. Scaffold in Parliament because there's a disagreement on this particular seat. This one, a uh, friend of ours called Ledama Olekina, it's like, <laughs> why always me? So Ledama is elected into this position as deputy chair of this committee. And the nominated senator, uh, Mary Seneta, Senator Seneta, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> stands up to say, why, what do you mean? I, I'm, uh, what happened? I don't, I don't agree with the process of that this has taken. Now, Senator Beatrice Komboka, who also happens to be the deputy minority leader, confronts Senator. And a scaffold breaks out. Are they fighting over the, the, the issues that you're reading, or had there been something brewing? Because Senator, remember, mm. is alleged mm. to have been on the Tanga Tanga side, mm. and then she shifted camp. Mm-hmm. And sometimes uh, you may shift camp, but all has not been forgiven. Mm. <laughs> mm. There's still some bad blood hanging around there. Mm. Maybe there's bad blood, but um, this provided a very good opportunity for them to actually come back and uh, bring it to the fore. So here are the issues. We've got to recognize I am the deputy minority. Mm, so were, the, were, were those matters resolved? Well, they were moved aside. Uh, By the time people come to blows... Mm. Uh, Temperatures must have risen. There must have been something. Also, but yes. also remember, before an election like this, there is a lot of jostling and campaigning, the push and pull and campaigning. And yes. during that campaign uh, period, words are exchanged, things are said, and uh, alliances try to be built and others broken. So friction can emanate from there. And now when you come to the floor of the house, we have beaten you. I mean, I ensure that you don't get the seat. Mm-hmm. And now here you are complaining. Or I thought I had... Uh, done a good job of securing this seat and now I'm seeing like you guys are playing games it's going to come out this section of the um, constitution that be- demands that people who are in offices such as this mm. behave in a certain manner <laughs> it's contained in the second schedule yes. of the constitution Yes, it says any elected leader must once during their term Behave this way, mm. and, uh, <laughs> yes. and the behavior failure that, to which mm-hmm. uh, they yes. lose their seat. Yes, exactly. Now the behavior <laughs> that we are seeing exhibited here, yeah. I'm sure is it goes completely. It's completely contrary to the dictates and the spirit of that particular part of the constitution. Is that not so? Now that part of the constitution I'm, I'm just talking about is the one that says that they should behave this way. It doesn't. At like, least once in your term. <laughs> <laughs> you realize he's joking, right? At least once <laughs> in a five-year term. I know he's a temper pulling my leg. <laughs> <laughs> we expect you to behave in a manner that would not be expect you to. Uh, yes, at least once a week, I expect you to pull my leg. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Other stories in the papers. <clears throat> right. Um, one that has actually taken the front page of the Standard today. Shock of dead children in car at a police station. Detectives burn midnight oil after the lifeless bodies of two four-year-olds who've been missing for 10 days were recovered from the boot of a car, then parked at a police station. It, it is a mystery. Um, the bodies of two children reported missing 10 days ago were on Tuesday recovered from the boot of a car parked at a Machakos police station where they'd been reported as missing. The girl and the boy, both aged four years, went missing from their KMC estate on June 11th 
while playing outside their house. Others in Athi River Police Station, where the matter was reported on the same day, have been searching for the children. The parents have also been conducting a search, including visiting hospitals and mortuaries, until Tuesday afternoon when fresh clues emerged right under the nose of the police. Hmm. A Nairobi salesman who had gone to the station on Tuesday to pick his detained car informed the officers that there was a foul smell from the boot of his Toyota Belter. The vehicle had been lying at the station for over three months after it was involved in an accident on Mombasa Road on, on the 4th of March. It is after he opened the boot of his car that he noted the strange cargo covered in a black paper bag. The officers then opened the bag and found the two bodies. When the owner came to pick the car, I quote, he realized that there was a strange cargo in the boot of the car, which was wrapped in a black paper bag. And this was according to an investigating officer who was familiar with the matter. Yesterday, government pathologists were called to the scene to help DCI with the investigations. And investigators from the DCI homicide unit based at the headquarters in Nairobi yesterday took over the investigation. Parents of the children were also summoned to the police station to confirm that the bodies were those of their loved ones, Alvina Mudeo and Henry Jackton. Mudeo and Jackton, who had been described as best friends, also happened to have been in the same school and sat next to each other in class. They were both the firstborn in their families. Pathologists and DCI officers could not immediately establish whether there were any visible injuries on the bodies. There was no blood stain either on the minor's clothes or in the vehicle. Investigators said the bodies were decomposing and could have been inside the car for well over a week. And strangely, They've no one at the police days. station had complained of a foul smell at the busy parking lot. And they had been missing for 10 days. It's, 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 okay. It's a shocker, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. It's a complete shocker. Let's talk about it uh, when we come out of this short break. These are two children. They are not siblings. They are best friends. Mm -hmm. They come from the same estate. And this estate, KMC estate, uh, is not very far from the Earth River Police Station. No. Nope. It's not very far. It's just within the vicinity. So go missing. Um, parents go everywhere, go to police station, go to hospitals, go to mercheries. Nobody can find them. And then somebody whose car had been detained by the police comes to pick their car. And mm. that's when the, this is discovered. There's timelines of, of some odd events that we'll look at when we come back. Yeah. You know, certain people asking for certain amounts of money through certain parents. We'll look at that. Uh, okay. It's half past six. It's a situation room. Kenya's biggest conversation. Let's take a look at traffic. And then come back to this story of mystery of the two children's bodies were found in a car at a police station in Adi River. Good morning. So far, not so much. On Kangundo Road, it's flowing very well, all the way from Caltex. Everybody knows that area in and outbound. We don't have an issue there. Yesterday, around the Comorock Junction, in the road there, where we saw some dra drama, it looks all right today. Everything sm is uh, smooth at the moment. Namanga Road, um, Kisangela traffic, then coming down towards Mombasa Road, is looking pretty good as well. We're not recording any drama so far. Likely to enter into traffic hour very shortly, and we will see heightened levels of traffic. We already know Mombasa Road, and as well as Thika Road. How bad it's going to be, we don't know just yet. But in case you see something, like, slow anybody down, let us know. Spice FMKE, that's how you can reach us on Twitter. And let's see what the roads will look like through this Thursday. Okay, so let's look at this. Uh, um, Alvina and Henry went missing uh, outside their estate, outside their house 
at um, KMC Estates in Athi River. Parents report them missing on the same day at Athi River Police Station. Catherine Musembi, who's the mother of Alvina, received a call from an unknown person on the 13th of June. The caller asked the mother to send 500 if she wanted information on her missing child. June 23rd, another person claiming to be a chief from Bomet calls Musembi, who is the father of the other child, and demands a thousand shillings in exchange for the details of the missing children. On the 23rd of June, same, uh, the next day, another caller asks Musembi for 1,500 shillings and claims he has spotted the children in Bomet in the company of a woman. The mother disregards the caller and, ref and informs the Athi River police. On the 30th of June, police then find two bodies inside a car parked at the Athi River police station and parents confirm the identities of these two children. So now it's coming out that it's possible that these would have been the victims or could have been the victims of a kidnapping. Um, how they were taken away from the estate and if these are the details, nobody quite knows um, right now. Investigations are continuing, but then it's quite worrisome that... Uh, um, if calls were made, and look at the amounts that these individuals were asking for, f just for this information, not necessarily mm. that they were the kidnappers or mm. if it was a kidnapping that then went sour, but somebody was asking for a thousand, a thousand a shillings, five hundred shillings. So there was five hundred shillings, there was a thousand shillings, and then there was one thousand five hundred shillings that was requested. I'm getting this feeling that these people who are calling are just the uh, people who call because they've seen this. I mean, it's been advertised everywhere mm. on social media, on Facebook and all, and their details are there if you spot them, call these numbers. Um, maybe just trying to take advantage. Mm. Because when you call and ask for a thousand bob, um, in the other cases that you've heard of kidnappings, they ask for a lot more money and they are a bit more, there's a lot more information that they uh, seem to have. You know? Yeah. 1,500 calling and saying, just give me 1,500. And I'll give you information about where this child is. And then you ignore that they don't call back. Mm. Uh, the other one calls and says, I'm a chief in Bomet. Give me, send 1,000 Bob and I'll give you details of where you can find these children. And somebody else calls and says, I have seen these children in Bomet. Just send 1,000 Bob again. Mm. But it was clear that the information of their parents was, like you say, in so, on, on social media. So phone numbers and how to reach them then was not too difficult. So it yeah. could have been, it could have been individuals who were just trying to be, you know, uh, uh, quite fishy here. Mm. But for me, the ease at which children can disappear is something that is also quite worrying. And I know I, I'm just from a social perspective here. We don't know the uh, the criminality of it yet we don't know who mm. could have taken these children we don't know exactly what happened to them but the fact that they were playing outside their home which is supposed to be a safe area it's in an estate so it's closed in but still even within an area that is supposed to be protected as it were because they're playing outside their house that's the last time they were seen it is obvious that they were removed from that place so again even in terms of what sa safety then is available for children? We can assume that they're in an estate and they're playing, but we don't know what danger is still lurking right around because it is clear that they were removed from an area that was very just outside their homes. And both of these but, children, and even if they had strayed unknown, out of these estates, they couldn't have gone far. No, I they mean, couldn't. They, so it was, they it's clear that somebody around, took yeah. them. Yeah, it's clear that somebody took them, and. Somebody who had studied them, somebody who knew that they were playing together, knew who their parents were, knew that they were always together. Maybe not. They were always together. Well, no. Maybe the person who took them did not really necessarily know everything about them. Oh, well, not necessarily. No, I'm saying, but that, I mean, they, find they took, them somewhere, they took both of take them. them. But because the, the other thing that you'd ask yourself is the motive. Mm. If there was no callback, if uh, the two are not related, even if mm. the two parents, uh, the two sets of parents are not even. You know, related, and they haven't received calls saying this is what we are doing. And there's no, maybe there's an there's some story that hasn't come out yet. Which will oh, come for out sure, there is a story that on hasn't what come has out happened because in, we don't in, know exactly in, what in those ten yet. days of how the children could have maybe they were playing within the estate, or maybe they just ventured out of the estate for a bit because the KMC estate is is right there, right near next to Kenya, Kenya Meat Commission, not so far from the police station, but also it's. They, they are nearby schools, they are places and fields that children could go and play. If they had even gone out of here, these are only four years old. These are young kids. If uh, they've even strayed outside and you find them, you take them back or you tell them, go back home.
he would assume that somebody oh, would so take them assume. back. Maybe <laughs> this is a business that some people have been involved in mm. because stories have been rife about child kidnapping in mm -hmm. that particular area. Well, mm -hmm. there's been stories of child kidnapping in Nairobi and Kenya, mm. but in that particular area around Arthur River, there have been many stories. Now, this incident simply lends credence to that, that indeed uh, children do get kidnapped. Yes. Now, that they should end up dead, probably having suffocated in the boot of a car, is tragedy upon tragedy. Mm -hmm. But I am certain that the police will get to the bottom of it. Yeah. I think so. There are very many questions, yeah, to, to that that emerge out of this. And yes, the stories of uh, children going missing are not just actually in, in just Athi River. It's Athi River, you can see. Case reported somewhere in Westlands, case reported in Rongai, case reported in Kitengela uh, of children going missing. There was but in many mm. cases when you hear that the, a child has been kidnapped, then the kidnapper is always trying to um, get something out of it. Their, their motive is to kidnap, not just to kill. They are kidnapping for either ransom or if they are kidnapping for a ritual or something, then you'll find other details. Like uh, if it's a serial killer, then you'll find some signature of killing. Hmm. In this particular case, children are found here. They were found in the boot of the car. They are wrapped in a polythene bag. So clearly they did not stray into the boot of the car and wrap themselves in a polythene bag. You know, you'd also ask yourself. But you remember, possible, really? this vehicle was at the Athi River police station since March. This vehicle was not brought to the police station with the children in the boot. Of course. So it is clear that somebody came with them, wrapped in this bag, and then put them in the boot, which was parked at the police station since the 4th of March. So they were brought there, and this was done, and nobody really noticed what was going on, whether it was at night, whether it was during the day. But, you know, somebody felt the need to bring them to the police station, then where they which would be found. probably means the children were already dead. Yes. Yep. Yes. By the time they were being brought, the the being brought to the police station, they were most likely dead. But there's one little element also that comes to mind. Sometimes children are kidnapped as a revenge. Mm -hmm. The parents uh, may have offended someone, and they feel, or a parent may have offended uh, someone, and uh, they feel that the only way they can get at this particular individual is to kidnap their children. Yep. When it was rife, when, when, when these stories began to, to, to spike about two years, three years ago, it was found that a lot of the people who then were involved in taking these children were individuals who previously worked in the home, whether they worked in a nanny capacity, house manager capacity kind of thing, and they felt slighted for one reason or the other and found a way then to remove children from their homes, hoping that their parents would pay uh, something, or like you say, revenge for one way or another in which they felt they were treated, which was not right. And you find that in a lot of the cases, the people involved used to work in that home at some point. But that'd be a, some, some sign. That'd, that'd be a call demanding ransom. Yes, there would there'd be a be call. Something. Yeah, 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 there would be something. Not just, you know, a child goes missing and a child is found dead with no communication whatsoever from the person who's uh, kidnapped this child, who's taken this child. Mm. That, that's where some, some odd, and uh, maybe the details are not, we don't have all the details. We don't have the details, a but one thing that, that, that steps, that, that one thing that springs out to me very clearly now is that even where you think that children are playing and they're safe, in the times in which we are living now, they are not. And um, uh, we don't know exactly what happened here, but it's clear to me that in terms of vigilance, that vigilance needs to be stepped up a little bit more. Yep. Now to say that even if children are playing in a familiar setting, we need to actually be careful and keep an eye on them because it is very easy for somebody to be picked up and taken out of the gate without anybody's, without anybody's attention, really. And there are more and more cases of children disappearing in this manner where you think they're playing one minute and then they're gone. So I think it's important for the vigilance to be stepped up. People have to be a little bit more careful. You think you're watching a child, in a minute they're gone. And here we are with, unfortunately, two children dead. It's a very... It's, it's it's a painful one. Mm. It's a painful one. Hey. Okay. What other interesting story do you have, CT? Uh, the other interesting story that I have seen is in the business section on page 36 of the Standard, mm. where Treasury warns state bodies that don't pay bills. Government officials face the sack if they fail to pay pending bills, the National Treasury has stated. 
You know, uh, is this the same pending bills we've been talking about? Pending bills, yes. They're talking about state officials who've been holding on to billions that have been pending and which they should have been paying vendors. Old to suppliers. So now, the the warning is that you'll get fired. <laughs> That's the warning, you'll get fired. Not prosecuted, just fired. Just fired. Mm -hmm. That's it. You face the sack. That's what's been reported here. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, because if you think about it, right? Um, yeah, it's okay. You can warn them with the sa you can uh, threaten them with a sack, but also there's 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 there are many no, but, other but, but disciplinary measures to be taken. But that is part of the public um, finance management act of 2012. That's what it states. Well, it, it gives leeway for someone to get sacked. Mm -hmm. One, if they make an authorized expenditure, and I think alongside that, there is the the. the if, if you make an authorized expenditure, you can get sacked. Mm -hmm. It means also, if you unlawfully withhold yep. the other side of this particular coin, funds that are due, uh, that have been approved, rightfully approved and rightfully due to someone, mm. then you face the same fate. Okay. One of the things that uh, has been happening over a long period of time, mm. the private sector through the Kenya Association of Manufacturers has tried over the years to try and mitigate on behalf of their members who are also owed money by the government mm. to sort this thing out. But clearly, this has fallen on deaf ears. Yeah. But even what I'm reading here and what the cabinet secretary, uh, it, it, well, what is uh, reported as having been said by the uh, cabinet secretary, this to me is stupid. It, 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 how many times are, the president himself warns people <laughs> and then you wait for change to come and you don't see change. So now it's going to be a CS warning people. CS warning people. And, and they expect the things sack. That <laughs> Well, one thing for sure is that the CS has uh, apparently issued a circular telling everyone, every ministry and uh, uh, government accounting officers that in the new financial year, the first charge from the new financial year is pending bills. Before you spend money on anything else, pay pending bills. You know, these amounts, Eric, are staggering because the pending bills amount to something like 137 billion. This was according to the report of the Auditor General. Mm. But and 42 billion are what you call historical debts. Mm. Things which were in the previous government, <laughs> they, 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 they were brought previous over. Previous financial yes. years and all. Mm. And yet these, these are monies. Where the problem, in my opinion, arises is that mm. these are monies which were not only approved and budgeted for, but they're available. So, what exactly is happening to this money? Hmm. Many Where have said it, it has been issues about, you know, the availability of the money coming from the National Treasury. And that's why the National Treasury is very much at the forefront of this. Now that they've been ordered to make sure that clear pending bills. And there are some businesses, business people who have been saying that, yes, this, the process has started. It's slow. It has started. Eric. Now you see what's happening in the other part is... When you now come to the individual ministries and uh, government agencies, the accounting people are also now playing games. And you're saying counties also, oh, mm. and their bill is something like 100 billion. Now, even in the counties, they will tell you, yes, they have started. Mm. But my friend, that pace is so slow and so uncertain. I guess this is where now these officials come in. Maybe these officials are also now playing that game of because I want to shake you down. So I, you know behave like you know nothing has happened just so that i can get something out of it eric our friends who, 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 business, who have been doing business in the counties mm. and if i'm to believe the things that they tell me mm. one of the things that they say the government clearly stated that when pa pending bills were to be paid you start off with the person who's been owed the for the yes. most time yes yep. said so that's not not the case a little window dressing here but by and large you'll find someone who supplied things a month ago and they've been paid Mambo ni and this is where these officers come in. You see, when you're doing all those kind of games, there's definitely going to be a delay somewhere. <laughs> 13 minutes to 7 o'clock. <laughs> Let's take a quick break.
classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. An interesting story in between the stage 5 of the nation this morning, okay? So, um, after surviving Spice the up your life. MCAs at the Senate, the county governor of Kirinyaga has uh, presented, of course, a budget for 2020-2021 to the county assembly of Kirinyaga. <laughs> MCAs have returned that, but they've slashed quite a bit of uh, the pro budget proposals. Among them is reducing the legal fees uh, from the executive's uh, budget from 60 million shillings to, take a guess. To do. Uh? They've reduced it from 60 million. So this is what the executive has presented. Uh, our legal fees budget is 60 million shillings. They've reduced it to? 20. 20, city? I said 20. No, go lower. Fif 10, even. 10? Uh -uh. <laughs> okay, we'll take a million. Okay, five. Five, no. We'll take a million. One. Seriously? Million. <laughs> Shillings. Okay. Annual budget. Legal fees for the year. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> At can afford lawyers. Okay, here. One million. The MC's father flexed their muscle and almost did away with the entire 111 million shillings allocated for the county, the office of the county secretary, effectively crippling the governor's operations. 60 million shillings legal fees, 1 million. 111 million shillings are going to the county secretary's office, reduce, put it to complete nothing. Now the governor is basically complaining and saying, come on, the budget making is a very important part of the government's planning and decision making, which the MCAs are meddling with. She's challenging the MCAs to be orderly, claiming they have no powers to arbitrarily amend the budget. Mm -hmm. She's observing that the, besides failing to oh. approve the budget on time, the MCAs amended the budget, allocating themselves an additional 200 million shillings. Okay. That's how it works, eh? But yes. Read, read that again. Yeah. <laughs> She's talking to stop meddling. Yes. Meddling. Mm. Meddling. Mm. In their own business. But I thought this was their business. <laughs> Not so much. No, oh, Honestly. No, 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 no. What she's saying is um, the government's planning and decision-making is what they're meddling in. 
the executive's planning and decision making. When you come and reduce this budget from 111 million shillings to almost nothing, from 60 million shillings to almost nothing, basically you're crippling the operations of the executive, which the executive is one that runs the county. You guys, your job is um, oversight and legislation. Mm -hmm. So when you cripple all these things, basically you're just t telling the government you not cannot operate. You'll not, start hearing those stories of Akuna Mafuta. They are not crippling the operations of the county. They are crippling the operations of the governor. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yes. You, you must differentiate it. And also, mm. if again I'm to believe what uh, you've just read, mm -hmm. then the attitude that she has towards the MCAs clearly has not changed. Has not changed. Yep. She f it, 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 it sounds, look, folks, know your place. Now that statement is laden with a lot of... But you see also what the MCAs have done. They have uh, allocated themselves a f an additional 200 million, you know, to run budget operations, I mean, operations of uh, that are directly in, 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 in line with the MCAs. Eh? Now she's saying, look, what we are seeing the MCAs doing is basically taking the appropriations bill that we've taken to Parliament, throwing it away, and the uh, Assembly coming up with its own appropriations bill. That is not their job. What? what their, that is the job of the finance CEC. You guys are only supposed to come in and amend. But this is what they've done. They've amended it. They have not amended it. Like, they have thrown it away. They have <laughs> done their Eric, own. Eric, Eric, I don't know. There's amending the and there's powers. rewriting. I don't know the full powers that MCAs have. Mm. But if I'm to look at the powers that Parliament has, my friend... Mm as stated in the Constitution, those powers are vast. In fact, perhaps when we see them being exercised, they are first surprising. Yep. And then you wonder, oh, you mean they had all these powers all along? It's possible. Yes, mm. now that's one. Number two, mm. I think she's missed the point. These people know very well that they can't go around allocating 200 million shillings to themselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. they're, they're negotiating. Mm. Come no. and talk to come, us. Come, 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 come. Please come. Mm. Mm. Come, baby, come. Mm. It's one way to get their attention. And it's bend one the knee. Yes. <laughs> it's one way to get her attention. Bend it's getting her attention. Yes. They wouldn't and have been able to get it otherwise. this thing that we disagreed about, which all of us, we, we all agreed quietly, mm. without actually talking, we should not mention. There are some considerations that we must have. Anytime a governor has issues with the MCAs, mm. believe me, there is money behind that problem. It's about money. There's money behind that problem. It doesn't matter. Power is about who has the resources mm, and who's mm. distributing the resources. And they are saying, and they are saying, you know, I once attended a funeral mm -hmm. in my neck of the woods. And uh, the senator who was here was at that funeral. Mm. And he said something that I heard. And he repeated it and I heard. Again. And I made note. Mm. This is what he said. He said, you MCAs within this county of Kisumu have been complaining and complaining and complaining about the executive. Mm. Are you not aware of the powers that you have? Mm -hmm. Don't you know the powers that you have and what you can do? He said, every problem you're talking about, you can resolve if you decide to utilize the powers that you have. Yep. And I said, oh, ho. <laughs> uh, I, that for me, was sufficient it was the take home message and it's, it's it's actually a powerful one the assembly is a very very powerful body national assembly county assembly even the senate they're powerful, they're powerful. bodies mm. they're powerful and well in this particular case what we are seeing here is that tassel is they're basically just trying to show her you know what eh? when you bring the budget to the assembly our job is not just to rubber stamp <laughs> we are a budget making assembly <laughs> you bring your proposals we look at your proposals, we can amend your proposals, we can reject your proposals in total. So, in fact, be like, be happy that we are just amending. Actually, we've just reduced it. <laughs> we could have scrapped it. <laughs> we just scrapped it. We could have scrapped it completely. This allocation, why do we need to appropriate money into this? Justify. No. They did promise that this thing that supposedly had ended mm. in the Senate was not really ended. Mm. Did they not promise so? Yeah, they did. The battle yeah. that they brought to the floor of the Senate now mm -hmm. continues. Said, yes. this one it continues. Uta it Uta Kipata. Mm. Yes. You will find us. Remember, if you look at the functions of Parliament, mm. as we know it, and the powers of the Senate, we, as 
what are the three arms of government? These three arms of government are, are there to check each other. Mm. So one doesn't tend towards excesses. And that is why one often feels that if, say, the executive seems to be on very chummy terms with parliament, yeah. you feel the citizenry is going to actually be on the losing end of this particular conversation. They are supposed to check. In the same manner that the judiciary is also supposed to be to do precisely that. Mm. So what we keep seeing, what we are seeing, the tussle that we keep talking about, uh, that's between the judiciary and the executive, it is actually good. Mm. We are actually seeing democracy in operation and we are actually seeing the Im implementation of of the powers that these bodies actually have. Yep. Right. Yes. Indeed. Coming to the top of the hour, remind us today's proverb. The grasshopper which was killed by the locust must be deaf. <laughs> this is from uh, uh, which part of the west. continent? It is west from the Igbo community. The Igbo. Is you that how you pronounce it? Igbo. Igbo. Mm. The G is silent. No, it's not. The, G is you just the, you just the colonial is silent, the, the G, but it's actually not the silent. Igbo. Igbo. Okay. <laughs> the Igbo people. <laughs> they, they, they preferred something that rolled easy on their Yeah. Mm, Good course. morning. It's now <laughs> 7 o'clock. Backed up all the way as far back as Mombasa Cement. This is on Mombasa Road, well before the Mlolongo turnoff. And this is affecting traffic all the way to the SGR, even further down towards Cabanas. Um, and the uh, before that, the JKIA, off the JKIA turnoff. So it is quite the chock -a block situation already on Mombasa Road this morning, right around 7 o'clock. We're likely to see this um, go on for most of the morning. And we're going to keep an eye on that, but we already know that it's a bumper-to-bumper -bumper situation on Mombasa Road. Looking at industrial area today, right around Lunga Lunga Road, getting towards um, Enterprise Road, that also is held up and it's going to affect traffic on Jogo Road as well as people try to get out that way towards the CBD. So we already see a buildup of traffic there. Already, guys, you're going to have to get out your patience hat because it's going to be needed today. Langata Road, getting towards the Timor Roundabout, moving very slowly, but then you'll be fine Um Getting towards the Nyayo Stadium roundabout for now. That's going to hold up though later on. Coming out of Westlands, right around the 87 and then down towards the roundabout and into the CBD. Moving slowly but not too terrible right about now. We'll look at Thicker Road in a while, but we assume that it's building up slowly as well. Let us know what you see. Spice from KE on Twitter. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. This conversation Luka, continues. Researcher. Room, we are Acad live streaming on Spice FM, KE, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, as well as www.spicefm.co.ke. You can tune in if you're anywhere within the country. If you're in Malindi, 97.7. Manyeri, 90.9. Eldoret, 96.7. 96.0 in Nakuru and its environs. 102.5 in Kisumu and its environs. 87.9 Mombasa and Nairobi. 94.4. Now that we're still talking about counties, let's okay. just continue talking about counties. Let's go to Mombasa, shall we? In Mombasa, 
Six slots in Governor Hassan Joho's cabinet are still vacant, seven months after all the executive's two-year contracts expired. The governor has also not appointed substantive chief officers in eight of the 18 slots after the occupier's contract expired at the end of January. This is according to the story by The Standard this morning, which says that Joho has nominated former uh, Education Executive Tendai Mtanalewa to head the Department of Agriculture. Mtana's nomination now awaits the County Assembly's vetting on July 7th. The County Assembly has already actually uh, asked Mtanalewa to prepare uh, to appear before them. And on November 18th last year, the Governor promised to appoint a new team or renew the contracts of former CECs in two weeks after a forensic audit of their performance. The two weeks are not yet over because you know there's COVID and COVID has slowed down the number of hours you have in a day. So we now we have about uh, 175 uh, hours per day. Oh, okay. So we still not have, uh, we haven't done 14 days yet. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, two civil society groups criticized Joho for his failure to fill the empty position, saying this has affected delivery of key services in the county. Mm. Yeah. This is uh, a cabinet operating at half mast, basically an executive. The executive is supposed to be uh, the governor, the deputy governor, and up to 10 CECs. Mm -hmm. So now here we have is a governor, a deputy governor, and up to five CECs. Five slots that were previously occupied by other people um, uh, have not been filled up. Why? It's the process. You see now he has appointed... It takes a while, eh? He has nominated one. Has this not been the way it has been yep. for the last... Uh, almost a year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been almost a year that this has not been... Surely can't take that long to appoint uh, some people. <sighs> even if you are looking at candidates from across the county. Mm. Mm? So that is Mombasa. Okay. Let's go to Bungoma where uh, Mr. Wycliffe Wangamati is facing issues with his MCAs. Cl cl clerics have urged the governor and the MCAs to resolve their differences and work together. These are religious leaders who are saying the protracted wrangles between the executive and the assembly uh, derailing development, and they want Wangamati to reach out to Fort Kenya leader Moses Wetangula and agree on how best to steer the county forward. I don't see where I don't know where the party leader is coming in, but also you see if he's the leader of your party and you have a majority in the assembly, then it's also possible for the leader of the party to actually come and play mediation. Right mm -hmm. now, this is MCAs who want to remove Wangamati. Uh, religious leaders, opinion leaders in the area saying, guys, before we get to that point, why don't you just find the same way City was saying, find some space, sit down and talk. What do you want? Maybe they've already talked and it isn't, it isn't working. Okay, so talk some more. S whoever needs to sit ground, sit ground. Because somebody needs to sit ground. You can always find a middle, middle ground. Yeah. I, I'm a firm believer in, you know, conversation, the art of conversation, not just in, you know, making it interesting, but coming up with solutions. And I think it's one way that uh, you can find a way. There is always a way. Mm. So long as there is a will, there's a way. So now the question goes to if we maybe we're not really actually willing to find a solution to this. Because if we were, I think we could do it. Yeah, it could be done. Come on. I mean. What are some of the issues that we are looking at here? <laughs> they, they seem to be completely hell-bent on wanting to teach this governor a lesson. But, um, you know, the, the, everybody else is saying, find a solution to this. Mm. We can't keep having this, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Actually, back and forth. you can. Whenever you have political competition at this level, mm. and there are all sorts of things at play, and people are aligning themselves uh with the uh, the view to occupying certain positions in 2022 mm. or they'll be back and or that back and forth I is a given okay but here yeah, the citizens now leaders of uh, ordinary citizens were coming out to say you see this kind of tussle that you're having you are forgetting what that, you're supposed to be doing yes that we, they, we have expectations of you let me ask and you're not meeting those expectations. Eric, let me ask a simple question. Since when have politicians and the decisions they make considered the people they supposedly represent? At least when you do something that is 80% to your benefit and that 20% comes to me, it's better I can than see that you're doing something. zero coming to me. You know, it isn't as though if they're tussling, uh, there'll be more benefits coming or less. 
The truth of the matter is when there's competition is when you're most likely to get things because people will compete to try and see what they can do, what they can please the public with. Mm. When there's peace, nothing will get done. Mm. When they seem to be getting along, nothing will get done. W what do they need to prove? Who do they need to bring on their side? When there's this sort of tussle, mm. it then means that you have to prove that you're a better leader than the other. How do you prove? You'll talk, but you also make some serious attempt to actually get certain things done that you think that people may want to see done. Mm. Yes. So you'll actually now try to be playing to the gallery. You will actually try to actually prove that you are better in the sense that you are not this leader who just talks. You are the leader who actually brings, as we say, brings development. Mm. Mm. Yes. Why do you think it is that Kenyan politicians align themselves quickly to the government? Because... When you're aligned to the government, you can have a quiet word with a minister in a certain ministry and say, you know, this thing in my part of the world was budgeted for, but it was never initiated. Mm. Is it possible for you to speed this process up? Mm. And they may do you a favor and speed it up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So the county assembly, let's go to Nakuru, where the county assembly <laughs> of Nakuru, uh -huh. okay. you know, they have a tussle with the governor. Yes, they do. And yesterday you saw the, the quote where the governor was saying, bring it on. I'm ready Th for you. And that you questioned is that. a mistake. Those MCAs are not just going after this governor. They're also going after the previous governor, Kenudia Mbogwa, who is now the status controller. And they are saying that uh, in the 2015-2016 fiscal year, there was some 3.5 billion shillings that uh, was embezzled or misappropriated. Mm -hmm. And they want the ESCC to actually investigate the previous governor, Kenudia Mbogwa, over cases of embezzlement, fraud, or misappropriation of public funds, amounting to that 3.5 billion shillings. That they're saying the governor needs to take administrative responsibility over this. This is, uh, according to the County Public Accounts and Investment Committee, uh, which uh, the chairperson of that is uh, taken this report table to Parliament by the chairperson of the Senate, uh, Peter Kajuang, follows the review of the Auditor General's scrutiny of the county's financial statements. This report indicates that the county paid pending bills amounting to more than 1.5 billion shillings to suppliers, but provided no proof of these transactions. 1.5 billion shillings has gone to pay pending bills, but eh, there's absolutely no paper trail. It further reports that while recording the pending accounts payable at, as at June 2016, the county overstated the amount by over 27.7 million shillings. Hmm. Questions, 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 and they're demanding answers now. Well, look at the trend of all of this. I mean, we've, we've Mombasa to Bungoma, Bungoma to, to Nakuru, all of this Kirinyaga, involves... Kitui. At the end of the day, like we said, the power struggles and the money. All of these, they come hand in hand. It's, you know, you can't really separate one to the other. Mm. So in the management of the money, in the distribution of the power, this is where we see the problems. And like, uh, it's interesting because when then, uh, if, it, if it is for, to, to push for development in these particular counties, that really is on the back of burner, right? It's not really at the fore. It's a jostle for power. It's a jostle for the distribution of money in terms of who's going to get the favor to be able to do one thing on the, or the other. And what gets the back seat? The back seat every time is the people and the development, yep. which should be at the fore. So even as these wrangles and these power struggles come out into the open, it is clear, evidently clear, that uh, the interest of the people is never really considered. That development, true development, is never really considered. It's about, you know, whose chest is going to stick out through the jostle Imagine. and who's going to come out the winner. <laughs> Whereas the thing that you were put there to do, doesn't, <laughs> it is never, ever, the, it's never the, the point of the discussion, the point of the power struggle. It really isn't. I don't know, man. But it seems to be quite destabilizing when you think about it. That these struggles that come out, if you saw that people were fighting and saying, actually, no, this money that has been allocated, this road needs to be done again. Or we need to make sure that this school or this hospital or this other thing is done or sorted. Yep. Then people will be able to say, okay, they're fighting over something that is going to eventually benefit the people. But here we are fighting over personalities and distribution of um, favors. And in some cases, tenders where an individual is going to get money in their pocket. Mm. It's quite a sad state of affairs. What, you do, what, what one would hope to see is them arguing of our prioritization of projects. Absolutely. That you're saying that you'd in like to ward, allocate this yeah. money into this side. No, 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 no. Allocate this money into this. If we look at this, this is going to... Infrastructure is better than this. Or yeah. Let's have the, such kind of arguments. 
say giving Actually, money for social protection yeah. is better than giving money to road is better than hospital Sheesh. or school is better than uh, a ward let's have that kind those kind of debates but when the debates are you know you have eaten too much money then the question uh, the, it basically is also saying that you have eaten too much money without considering that we also needed to eat yeah or you've bought a vehicle without re- re- bought a new vehicle for your office and we also would have liked mm. to have one for crying out loud what are we doing <laughs> now here you see too, yes that tussle sometimes uh, is important but it's not always beneficial you know eric in this country i think it almost always is beneficial Case in point, one practical example. When there was the handshake, one of the things that not very long after came to the fore mm. was a complaint by very much, it was the media, we saw it on TV, mm. uh, people loudly saying that why is it that we are not hearing a voice pointing out the things the government is not doing right? Mm-hmm. What brought one of these things to the fore was the increase of fuel. Mm. If we look at right now the tussle that has been magnified between the judiciary and the executive, we have a history in the past where the judiciary and the executive were one and the same thing. Mm. Now they are clearly are not. Mm. The thing that you're guaranteed is that both parties will try to prove that they are doing what they should do and the courts will try and hold their own and prove that as i said the examples we are seeing in the counties and all these things they may appear to be terrible things what they are are it is one the constitution being operationalized mm. and democracy at work this is what it is democracy doesn't work quietly it never does because it means for it to work it's up it's up staging and it's removing certain norms that people have been used to mm. it's never quiet it's never a really peaceful democracy the application of it never really that peaceful so as far as i'm concerned these tussles are good let them continue ah by all means let them continue let's look at the weather <laughs> Degrees. We will see this situation last through most of the day with highs of 23. And in Nyeri at 13 degrees is cloudy conditions. Rain expected later with highs of 21. Nakuru is mostly cloudy at 13. Highs of 23 will see showers in the afternoon. Eldoret will experience thunderstorms later with a high of 21. Kisumu at 27 degrees. The high today will be partly cloudy through most parts of the day. Thunderstorms and showers expected in Kakamega later with highs of 24 and lows of 16. 24 degrees are mostly cloudy in Mombasa, highs of 28 and lows of 23. Malindi will also experience rain later with highs of 28 and lows of 24, currently having mostly cloudy conditions. Kakamega at 19 degrees is mostly cloudy. It'll open up into an afternoon of rain, highs of 25 and lows of 19. And then taking a look into Dar es Salaam, we're at 31 degrees the high today. Lows of 21 will have partly cloudy conditions. Johannesburg at 6 degrees, clear skies with a few clouds, but mostly sunny conditions throughout today with highs of 18 and lows of 4. And finally for now in Lagos, 25 degrees and clear skies enter into thunderstorms later with highs of 29 and lows of 24. Okay, so the big BI task force is uh, managed and I actually forgot that that the task force existed. Spice of Okay. Spice up your life. You know the problem. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. The point where the BBI, the BBI, 
agenda. agenda. Mornings One. done right. 94.4 uh, Spice FM, Nairobi. Nairobi. Was saying that Kenya has witnessed continued deterioration of relations between ethnic communities and political formations, often characterized by aggressive antagonism and competition. So, two, lack of national ethos. Kenya is today increasingly being affected by negative politics. They say that they'll define and promote a national ethos. Mm -hmm. Inclusivity is one of the greatest challenges that Kenyans ha face. On this, the president and, and Mr. Odinga are committing themselves to make the strongest efforts to uh, find the right skills and attitudes from as many backgrounds and identities as possible. Inclusivity devolution, entrenching devolution, divisive elections, safety and security. Many Kenyans' lives are afflicted by natural and man-made disasters. The two say that committing to have leaders in every part of Kenya, no matter their level, make practical efforts to ensure that those who are hungry or in distress are aided. They, are, they also vowed to address terrorism, corruption, shared prosperity, responsibility and rights. The report is expected now to be handed over to the two principals shortly. They look at it. We may have another bombers moment where it's presented again and they press a button and we have you know, confetti all <laughs> over. And then it goes to parliament and parliamentarians look at it and they follow what the dictates of their leaders will tell them. We want this and the other and they will vote that way. And they'll see how to position themselves in what, how they fit in uh, the cake that has been cut. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then we're hoping that this is going to change Kenya okay. to the better. Mm. City don't look to convince that it will change Kenya. It's not a question of being convinced it won't. Mm. Nothing will change. Well, oh, no, no. Things something will change, will change but Things not much. Change. When you say it will change Kenya, you are referring to an almost cataclysmic change that more or less overhauls this corrupt system that we have yep. and that brings about sanity to issues of government, yep. a place where there are no pending bills, yep. a place where hospitals work, a place where when roads are built you don't hear of kickbacks being given to those in mm. charge of those ministries. It's an honest society. That isn't going to happen. Mm. Not with the BBI mm. or with the FFI or mm. call any, any other I. <laughs> BBI. <laughs> See this thing for what it is. It mm. is a political move to put not this one is not just band aid, but a nice bandage mm. to a broken leg. Mm. Okay. The, we know the leg is broken. The X ray has been done. Mm -hmm. What you require is plaster of Paris being cast over it, or some of these modern contractions that they have. Or that, some of those metals. Oh, they, they have some wonderful new things that they, that they put, and we which enable you to walk within a very f short time. Mm. Okay. If they used a modern method, and the analogy I'm giving here of the plaster of Paris, mm. and 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 and, and, the, and the, the metal fitting that they put in your leg when it's broken. One is a modern way of ensuring that you walk quickly and that the bone heals properly. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. The other one was the old method, which also achieved the same thing. But note, I've said, they're putting a bandage on it. You will feel some relief. So there's, there's when, you, when you're putting a bandage, knowing full well, this is the problem and this is what I need to do. You're basically saying that you're not being honest. You're, de you're delaying the solution, really. Yeah. But you are giving the impression that you have you're provided something, yeah. something that is actually useful. It's because dishonesty. A bandage, yes, a bandage is not nothing. It's going to provide relief. The relief, however... Even psychologically. Is, the relief, the however, is temporary. As opposed to the relief of the more complete solution, which would be permanent. This is not even a temporary one. This is just a hoodwink. It's wool over your eyes. It is, you have a broken leg and then you're putting a bandage. How is that healing the bone? It's not. It just is providing relief. It's providing the illusion. So I agree with mm. you. It's providing an illusion that something is being done about the problem. But if you want to look under the bandage, actually nothing is being done. The issues are not being handled. The issues are not really being addressed. It's probably giving kind of window dressing to everything to make it seem as if something is being done, whereas the issue is not being handled. It's again, when you have a disease without going to the root of the problem, you treat the symptoms, but the disease is still there. 
which is essentially what this would be. And a lot of people have talked about this, that this would be just that. Preventing, or rather presenting something mm. that would just cover the surface. Yep. But underneath, you still have rot. And until you deal with that, you're not going to you're deal with the with problem. Anything. You still have your broken leg. You yeah. will not be able you to walk. You will not walk. Bottom line. You and will not operate you as you should. The bones uh, severed, the they worse continue it gets, to crack right? and become a, even more brittle. Walking on a broken bone will eventually cripple you. When you looked at that report, the initial BBI report, because now it was going through that whole validation process with the BBI rallies across the country, there are some se segments of it that were, you know, with, they were just basically dealing with the software of the country. Mm. Right, that uh, if we address these things, if we talk about you know starting to teach ethos and national nationhood ethos and from uh, you know from an early age in school and ensuring that it's part of the curriculum, so all these things do not even need a long term conversation. Mm. They are things that just require to be done, implemented. They are very good on paper. If you look at the whole scheme and uh, looking at the BBI rallies and what the leaders kept talking about all the time in the BBI rallies, it was mainly about the political positions and the organization of the national executive, right? And saying if the debate is whether you want to have a powerful prime minister versus a weak prime minister versus a president directly elected by the people versus a leader who is elected by parliamentarians. It's all about political power and political positioning. Hmm. Main thing. So that's the focus of it. And even if you look at what people are now saying, uh, the, 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 the realignments in parliament, it's positioning yourselves to what is it that we're going to do? Are we going to have a prime minister who comes from parliament? Are we going to have a um, uh, cabinet that is half coming from parliament? Mm -hmm. So I can be an MP going to parliament and then I'll join the cabinet. I'll have a flag. Are we going to have, uh, you know, women having greater say in parliament? Are we going to have more representation of gender? In it's about political power. And positioning. The other things that have been mentioned in the BBI may end up being just like all everything else that we see in our government, very good on paper, but implementation because there was no will in the first place. In the place. first place. Everything else is just, you know, just adding it up there so that we can accompany this one agenda. Exactly. And unfortunately let's create new positions in Mm. In, in national executive. It would appear that all these other things that they that have been... Look, look I mean, if you want to do apply some scrutiny to this, it would appear that all these other things that were added mm. um, were unfortunately just dressing. It's like the salad dressing. You put it there so that it, you know... And it looks very it good. It looks very nice. good. It even mm. tastes good. But at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is get the individual or whomever to consume the salad. Mm. Okay? And it would seem that these other things were then, you know... Uh, compensatory and that uh, all right we'll take it because it has come along but was the intent for you to gobble up the dressing just so that you can mask whatever else is going on it would appear that that is what it was and that it was not really dealing again with issues and if it was positioning at the end of the day if the individuals for which the intent was to be in particular positions mm. was was fulfilled, then all these other things that were promised or were discussed or talked about, which are inherent issues if you want to look at them, mm. would never be dealt with. And then you would go back into a whole issue of discussing them again and having wasted all of this time. So if the desire from the beginning was not to have all these issues come, it will be very clear. It will be very clear once all of this is done, dusted, task force has put this thing to bed yep. and whatever wanted to be achieved has been achieved, it will come through and it will be very clear that those issues that we spent a lot of time going around the country discussing one to the other, actually, there was no interest. Those were not the, those those were not were not the issues. When I sometimes I sit back and I think about it, what I see sometimes is an attempt to recentralize power. Mm. The 2010 constitution did something that uh, the later Chino Kajuan kept saying, what we are going to do is devolve power. Sema devolve power. <laughs> you know? Removing power from one central position and devolving that mm. power. Mm. Ensuring that, yes, we have a national executive that's headed by a president or a chief executive, whatever name you want to give them. They have their powers to run the national government and to represent the country as a head of state. But decisions at the local level shall be made at the local level by local leaders appointed by local people. Right? And that's where the devolution came in. Mm. Now, the whole stress and push and pull about the national government promising this is how much we're going to be giving to the counties is an attempt at, at recentralizing that power, mm. showing that 
it's the president who will decide. If we elect this person as president, they're the ones who will decide how much money trickles down to the counties. Mm. They're the ones who will decide this is how much you're going. The whole BBI conversation has also been talking about that. Let's increase the amount of money uh, being allocated to the counties from this percentage to this percentage. Let's increase to that percentage. And then the person who is appointed as a chief executive will add like one or two percent on top <laughs> of that tokenism mm. to show that they are the be all, say all, and everything and all. all. Mm. Same thing is happening to parliament. If you look at what the reports that were coming out in the weekend uh, papers about uh, people who are saying what's expected, what the rumor mills are saying about the, what the report is likely to propose, is if we talk about a uh, prime minister who comes from parliament and is appointed by the president, and the president ha would have power to dismiss this person. If you talk about half a cabinet coming from uh, uh, parliament, mm. this is a national executive basically running control of parliament. The same thing that we were maybe trying to run away from in saying that let, let us have clear separation between executive and legislature. Right. Where MPs will be MPs, they'll make laws, they'll check and balance the executive. The executive will be uh, running the country, but they will be answerable to the assembly. Before this, what did you used to have? President can go into the, the National Assembly, appoint ministers, and appoint the other half of parliament as assistant ministers. So basically, the president has control of the parliament. Hmm. With an attempt to go back into saying X percentage of uh, the cabinet shall come from parliament so that they can be going to report to parliament directly. It's an attempt in my books at the executive getting its foothold back into parliament and trying to control parliament. And what we're also seeing with a kind of push and pull between the executive and the judiciary is the same kind of thing. The executive trying to have direct and unfettered control of how the judiciary is running. So, mm. If you look at this experiment we had with uh, bringing in uh, corporate types or people who are bureaucrats into politics by making them CSs. Mm. This experiment has not worked well. Why? They were supposed to overhaul systems and bring about change. Tell me this change and this overhaul that you have seen. Tell me one ministry where this has happened. Education with Matiang. Tell me another. Education with Magoha. Magoha and Matiangi have been working in tandem as a tag team mm. from the time Magoha was chairman of the National Examination Council. Yep. All right? Yep. I'll give you another one. Now, you know, just to sweeten up that deal, we have had politicians in the same, same cabinet. They are politicians. It's not that they have come from, they are not at the corporate types. So yes, they were corporate, they went into politics, and then from politics, they flopped in politics, they were picked and brought into the cabinet. We have them. Yes, so, we have people like Munya. Yeah, and Balala. I understand and others. that perfectly. There's a reason why I'm mentioning this. Mm. The old system where you first had to be a member of parliament, then a minister, mm -hmm. and where it was understood that the account holder was the PS. Clearly, I believe it's still the case, mm. but it doesn't seem so. Okay? One of the things that that system provided was a case where in, in reality the minister was not just answerable to the executive. Mm -hmm. No. In this case, the CES is the ministers are answerable to the executive because that's the person who actually appoints you. Mm -hmm. Your whole job is based on that. Yes. In the previous one, you were still MP. And so answerable to? Well, answerable to parliament. To the well. people. Parliament, to the people. Parliament and the people. Parliament does not do, do anything to you. I mean... Eric, actually, that is um, a misnomer. It actually does. Because, you see, the same powers that Parliament had, for example, in, uh, in, in, in passing a motion of no confidence in a CS, in a minister, then they can do the same thing with a CS today. If Parliament felt that this particular minister is not running the uh, government well, they would do the same. That's why Parliament has the power of authorizing or approving a nominee to the cabinet. The president appoints, the president nominates rather, and parliament approves. So parliament has direct power over this CS. Let me tell you what I'm Senior. actually saying. What I'm actually saying is this. Huh? Mm. 
the matters that go on within our ministries are usually extremely political. Mm. When you bring a neophyte, who, someone <laughs> who was in the corporate sector, or someone who, what you've actually done is thrown this person into some very, very deep water and you're not even sure they can swim. So what will either happen? They'll actually join the band and the brigade of those uh, who have been doing the craziest things that you can actually think of, mm. or they will simply probably just sit back and be told what to do by these very same people. Yeah. The previous one... That is, that, is, that is still carrying over from the previous... Yes, so the I, 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 I'm, but they, I'm not saying that the previous one was better. And the I'm, attempt, I'm really drawing and the a attempt, parallel. The attempt here was to try and change that, you know, that entire saying that a ministry will be so completely politicized. Removing public service from that politics. All right, tell me, well, did we unpoliticize our ministries? That's what we are supposed to be doing. That's what we. That's, that's what we hasn't, should be hasn't pushing. It for. hasn't happened yet. Yeah, uh, we should be pushing yeah. for that. And but I'm saying, but why do we want to unpoliticize them? But the, mm. but but you see, here is the thing: the the power by politicians to control everything is what we are trying to undo in that whole move. That whole move of saying mm. let them come from outside parliament is trying to unclutch public service from this whole jaws of politicians, politicians running everything. Yes, politicians can have a say and will have a say, a direct say in how ministries are run because you are answerable to parliament in terms of checks and balances. But you don't owe them a favor. You know, Eric, <laughs> I don't think either you or I has a perfect solution to what we're discussing. Mm. But the truth of the matter is this. Our system is highly politicized, highly. Okay? Mm. And... I feel that someone who thinks they're answerable to people, in my opinion, stands a better chance of actually functioning well in a position of authority for this very reason. There is a check and balance mm. beyond just one. There is another, another, another power point that we need to be able to come down. And politicians tend to think along these lines. Let's take a shot. The five minutes to eight. Let's see the ball. And then this conversation. All right. So a uh, journalist overturned on the seven bypass, coming off of Mombasa Road as you're heading in the general direction, and this is just before the exit to Karen, and so this is affecting traffic that is outbound on the bypass and so you need to be careful approach with caution because it still has not been cleared away and um, it's already affecting the build-up then on the bypass so if you can avoid the area do so until at least that has been taken care of Waiaki way there's no traffic moving towards the city center shouldn't be a problem for you there on thicker road getting towards the um, uh, Pangani underpass as is usual we see a lot of traffic there is not so bad this morning so apart from Mombasa Road, which is absolutely gridlocked this morning, all the way from the Malongo turnoff. It doesn't look too crazy anywhere else. If you're on Mombasa Road, you're going to have to exercise patience today. We don't know what the cause is, but traffic is looking quite crazy right about now. See anything we should know about? Don't hesitate to let us know. Spice of MKE on Twitter. So we continue with this debate that uh, we have on um, the, what I am saying is an attempt by the powers that be to try and recentralize power by various means, coming back into parliament, clawing back into the, the judiciary and trying to have all those people answerable to the same. And you're talking about the current situation where we have CSAs who do not come from parliament and a proposal in the BBI of half of the cabinet uh, being picked from parliament. And the pros and cons of that. There are very many pros and cons. And I'm looking back at what was the thinking at the point where we're saying, let's delink them. Let's say that a uh, cabinet shall operate outside of parliament, but shall be answerable to parliament. 
Parliament has the power to summon ministers any time, any day. And that's why we see them going to the uh, Parliament all the time to answer questions. We see them doing that. When the President nominates uh, somebody to the position of CS, he cannot appoint if Parliament does not approve. Mm -hmm. So Parliament must approve this person. And they approve this by sitting with this person and interviewing them and looking at their uh, suitability to serve in this position. If I take that, just before you come in, if I take that structure and the way it looks like, it's exactly the same way it looks in the counties. Now let's talk about accountability of CECs to the county assemblies in the country. You see county assemblies exerting their power on CECs. Many county assemblies have actually impeached CECs and said, this person is not answering questions, is not responsible, is not doing what they're supposed to be doing because we know what they're supposed to be doing according to what they, uh, the, the, the law says. And they're not doing their job, so go. So this CEC is basically directly answerable to the people because they're answerable to the people's representatives. Our National Assembly has not impeached one uh, cabinet secretary. There has been no, move, no motion brought formally in the National Assembly raising issues or concerns about the performance of any CEC. We see them being, uh, not CEC, but uh, CS. We see them being changed by the president, but the National Assembly does not discuss and say, we have a problem with the way this particular ministry is being run by this particular person. And would it be terrible if it, if it happened that way? No, it wouldn't. Yeah. So that's this what I the, think this is what we are clamoring it would for. Ensure, it a, would ensure direct um, accountability of a CS to Parliament. Now, this is what I'm saying. These things then should be out in the open. Should be out in the open mm. if in case, because it could also be that even if there are issues, most of the time they're, you know, they're under the blanket somewhere and then they pushed, they get, you know, swept under the rug and they never actually come out. Yep. Now, I think that having such things play out publicly, what it does is that it increases your benchmark for accountability, especially then when it comes to performing duties to the nation to the assembly, to the particular office to which you've been called. But if operating from a position where you know that nobody is ever going to call you out, it gives you another kind of intoxicating power or semblance of such mm. that then you're indispensable. And uh, that in terms of authority, it, is, it goes as far as you can possibly and wide as, it, as you can possibly imagine. Yep. I do agree that when it then comes to calls for accountability, the way in which we see it playing out where members of the National, of the County Assembly, for example, can call out a governor and say, on count one, two, three, we feel as though you've not done your job. It should be able to be escalated to other levels as well. To say that, all right, um, in terms of accountability, in terms of administrating, ad 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 administering my duties, or we who have who essentially then have this role to play should be able to bring that out in public for everybody to understand and say, look, these are the things that we've called and said you should be able to do. Should you not then do them? The same way that when your appointment mm. was brought before us and we had to debate on the same, so should it be that in the carrying out of your duties then, yeah. we should also be able to bring that out and say, you know what, hold on. On one, two, three, we feel as if you have not been able to fulfill. We should then be able to. Uh, bring it out for censure. I think so. When I hear MPs complaining um, about this particular state of affairs right now, they say that when um, matters are brought about a particular CS, and a CS is someone, a CS takes a long time before they appear before the, the uh, uh, house. Because they're busy. And they go to a committee, and then mm. the committee is the one that interrogates the CS, and the committee reports to the whole house. Now, the entire assembly wants to be the one that is interrogating the, the minister. And that can be done by uh, just a mere change of standing orders and say that a minister, sh we shall have ministers coming before the house on such certain days, mm -hmm. if you want to. But the attempt here is for this same politician who's been appointed, who I mean who's been elected by the people, going a step higher and getting appointed into the cabinet and saying that now because I'm in cabinet, I'm more answerable to parliament and therefore to the people. And we don't see that happening. Just because you appear in, in, in uh, parliament to answer questions, Mr. Speaker, I am aware, this is my answer to the question that was raised two weeks ago mm -hmm. by a certain MP, and it, I am aware that this, 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 and these are the actions that we've taken, and therefore I, I, this <laughs> is my response. That is not different from somebody who is not in parliament answering the same question. Mm -hmm. It doesn't show me any sort of accountability. I see two games here being played. One, the politician who's uh, running in, in, who has been elected into office, wanting to jostle themselves and find that flag 
so that you can <laughs> go back home with some sense of elevated dignity and mm. saying, you know, I've also even been given a flag, I'm a minister, going back to the old days. And another one, the executive using this whole lady and saying it's a good opportunity for us to actually have a say in parliament. Mm -hmm. When you have a say in parliament, when you have uh, uh, the top leadership of that as, uh, assembly being also members of the cabinet, then there's that as well. We have a, a hand in how the uh, assembly is running. Mm. You know, the if you have a, a very large majority in parliament mm. and you also are the leader of that party that has a majority in parliament, mm. You have all the power you need. Yep. All. You don't even need to twist and turn anything else. You can have bills that you want passed. You can you can run the country as you see fit. Mm -hmm. But remember, like we see sometimes and we are seeing currently, is that because you're just in parliament and your leader is the leader of the executive, it doesn't mean that you have... Uh, absolute loyalty. He has to flex muscle. In We've this particular case, like what we are seeing now in Jubilee and uh, Parliament, what is it that we see happening in Parliament? The rewards came. You shall, you, because you're behaving well, we shall give you a position on the leadership of the Assembly. And what does that mean? That means that it's coming with certain parks. You know, those are... It's good that it ends there. It doesn't go beyond that into Cabinet. Actually, the cabinet is not spared either. Mm. The truth of the matter is that the way politicians think, and the president downwards, they are politicians. The way they think, the reward scheme has to be in existence. Otherwise, the political game and the powers that people jostle for cannot actually be effective. Mm. There has to be. Yep. For instance, the handshake will have his rewards for people who are in ODM. Mm. Yep. There'll be appointments here, appointments there, this one there, a few ambassadors here and there. It's how it works. And the reason why the executive uh, in my, uh, seems to, in this country, hold that particular sway is because at, from, at the point when they're the executive, at the point when the president is the president, he is the one who has the ability to decide mm -hmm. most of these things that we're discussing here. Mm. Whether an ambassador is going to be appointed, whether who is going to be appointed. Yeah. Okay. The one time when President Kibaki was president and yet those in the opposition had more people in parliament, that's one of the reasons why that check and balance was as strong was as it was. Yeah. Because you can decide all you like, those guys will just tell you point blank, that isn't happening. Mm. And because they have the numbers, then they, for sure, then you know that they have full sway. They do. Oh, mm. they did. Mm. Now, this is, again, the negotiation, the reward system comes in. Mm. Said, look, guys, okay. We would like this passed. We are aware we have these difficulties, but for now, because of this, it's important for the country. Can we? Horse trading is part and parcel of politics. It's part and parcel of politics. There is no political process anywhere in the world that doesn't have it. Of course. Mm. You must have that. But at the same time, you also need to ensure that the greater good of the public is also safeguarded. I don't see anything that, you know, for example, stops the executive from doing that horse trading with the assembly without necessarily saying that ministers shall come from there, without necessarily saying that I shall have full control. Can you imagine a state where the, uh, you are the president but you have a minority in parliament or you have a 50-50 in parliament and you don't have any of these other candies to Oh, by the dangle. way, there are very many leaders around the world who find themselves in that position. Yes. They're actually hostage. Yes. You're president, but you're hostage, say, to the opposition. Yes. Mm. And that's likely to happen at yes. any time in, in this country. Now, this attempt at saying, oh, the leader of the majority party or the leader of the majority coalition in uh, the National Assembly shall be appointed by the president as prime minister and shall therefore have some duties given to them by the, uh, by the president. It's what, another way of basically <laughs> saying the president, whoever is in parliament is okay. Eric, I'll deal with them. Uh, look at the country of Israel. Huh? Mm. The current prime minister, if I'm not wrong, this is his third time to be prime minister. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In between, he's been minister. He's been all sorts of things. But of interest... If you look at Israel, I'm choosing Israel, but I could have 
given the example of Italy as well. Mm. But, Part of the reason why there's so much movement is that nobody really ever has that clear majority yep. that enables you and your party to actually be in charge. Yep. You have to agree with others. You, you must have to form have a coalition. coalition. Always you must and form a coalition. And at some point in that tenure, the coalition will break and then you lose. Yes. And, and then you have to look for other partners to sort of like coalesce with and so forth. Or you forth go back forth. to an election. Yes. That's democracy hmm. at work. At work. Yes. Now, there are those who could argue that all those changes sometimes, they're not good for development. Italy has its issues. Right now, because of COVID, there are many things that are neither here nor there. But Israel, which is the example I was giving, has had this for the longest time, but they've continued to develop. Yeah. And part of the reason is because they have a very clear civil service. And also, I who actually run the country. Who run the but. country and who have the interests at heart. Look, and I, I'm going to come back to this thing. Interests at heart is is crucial here, mm -hmm. because why are people getting into positions of, of 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 office, public governance, whatever it is? A lot of people are getting in for selfish gain. A number of people, but then you still have a number of people where it works is where you have those interests have been aligned from the very beginning, and you will see that working every time. And you'll see even when um, they're falling out in, in terms of coalitions, it's on principle. We, in, on our side of our party, this is what we stand for, and you stand for this, and you stand for the other. And we came together hoping that what we stand for shall be realized. At least a bit of what we stand for shall be realized mm. in this government. Then we realize that you are not giving us what we wanted. The kind of program that we wanted to see implemented, which would have helped us now in, our, in the future in coming yeah. to campaign. You see, we have pushed through uh, these kind of programs. Then we pull out of this coalition. Mm. In this country, it's all about tribe and tribal alliances and tribal balance and all. It's not going to be on... We'll, it'll take us a long time before it's all a matter of principle that forms and breaks coalitions. Right? So the same kind of push that I was... I mean, the kind of argument that I was pushing in terms of looking at this and seeing a deliberate recentralization of power where we have Constitution of Kenya 2010 trying to move and creating independent bodies, independent commissions that shall have, uh, provide checks and balances. What is it that is missing in those independent commissions? They lack independence because they don't have control of the budget. Mm -hmm. Their budget is determined by the same central structure. It's the one that says the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights has been making too much noise uh, lately and exposing all the things that we are doing wrong, so we shall deny them some budget we'll next muzzle year. them here. We muzzle them. Yeah. Uh, hamper their operations, and we therefore, me it therefore means that they are independent, yes, but they will never move out of Nairobi. Mm -hmm. They'll never produce any report that is damning. We have control of it. Same movement has happened in the police service. In the police service, the Constitution tried to create an independent police service that, yes, uh, has, is, is answerable to, to the state, mm -hmm. but... In terms of operations and everything, there's some independence. There's an independent uh, police service commission. There's IPOA, an independent mm. uh, citizen-led oversight, oversight authority. authority. And the police service commission is led by uh, citizens, I mean, ordinary citizens. What happened? What did we see? We saw the mm. first appointment of the first IG, uh, David Kimayo. And David Kimayo appeared to everybody, you know, there was all these things that, oh my God. David he approached Kim issues and he David, was approachable. David Kimayo, my yeah. God, he can't do this job. And what happened? <laughs> uh, the executive coming to say, you see, I have no control of the police. Eh? Mm. We have all these things that are happening in the country. We have cattle rustling, spate of cattle rustling increasing in the country. We have terrorists coming all the way to Westgate, in the heart of Nairobi. I, as a, you know, the head of the executive, I don't have any control on how these guys operate. I need more powers. What did we see? The oh. president now <laughs> went, changed laws in parliament, and president has direct control of who is the IG. Mm. So the meaning that the central power is controlling exactly what is happening there. Same movement is happening in the judiciary now. With this whole thing of trying to smear, a complete smear campaign mm. against David Maraga, who is retiring in a few months' time. He said, he said, I'm going to be out soon. I'm on my way out. <laughs> yes. I'm on my way out. So, you know, you know, just chill. Let me finish. Let me just finish this thing. I'm going to be gone soon anyway. So this harassment that you may bring to my doorstep, essentially, um, is maybe not necessary that because I wouldn't be here for too long. was never forgiven. No. It, the overturning it, of the election result. That was never forgiven. I see sometimes like that is an excuse. Why? That is not the the real the real reason or the real That's trigger. That's not the of reason why they're turning the screws on it's him. It's not the real trigger of what's happening. What the trigger of what's happening is 2010. 
2010 constitution comes in 2010 constitution calls for an independent uh, judiciary what do we start seeing Im immediately we have an independent what should be an independent uh, judicial service commission and the appointment of the first chief justice under this new constitution was done publicly everybody from here to inner mongolia was observing and seeing how is kenya going to reconstitute its judiciary the entire uh, vetting of judges was done publicly. Mm. So there was a lot of interest on what's happening to the judiciary, which was now gaining its independence. And we saw somebody who is a respected human rights lawyer who has pushed for uh, uh, multipartism in, in the country and entrenchment of democracy, founded the Kenya Human Rights Commission, led uh, international NGOs like Ford Foundation, being appointed as first chief justice. The central guys could not do anything at that point. Mm. But their time, man left. After man left, second person comes in. Respected judge of the Court of Appeal, served in the judiciary for many years, but clearly with some weaknesses. And exploiting those weaknesses is a very easy thing to do for the powers that be. That thing has been exploited from day one. The issue of, um, you know, showing that the man could not be controlled because of what happened in 2017 is just an addition to the wheels moving to a point where you want to have direct say in who becomes Chief Justice. This whole thing of it being done publicly and I don't know, it's too open and we'll have a Chief Justice who we don't know and uh, judges of the Supreme Court whom we don't know, no. It's going to be controlled. The thing at the back of my mind is basically telling me, this whole thing of, you know, showing... You're saying totally, that going through all of this erasing, is to maintain an element of control in all completely areas. Completely erasing the work that a man has done in the judiciary for many years and showing this man is so, look, he's just a crybaby. Look at what is happening. And somebody, some woman comes out in the media to claim other things. Look, <laughs> he's trying even to be, besmirch their character. In the end, what shall happen is, uh, no, 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 no. We need to have, you know, guys, we need to have a proper chief justice <laughs> who understands this job. We need to have a proper chief justice. Who uh, so knows I hear how you saying understanding this it. job and knows how to deal with issues, then is making decisions Singing that are skewed in my direction. Yes. <laughs> I personally think if you're going to talk about the relationship of the judiciary and the executive, we cannot discuss it without bringing in the attorney general. He is the advisor, the legal advisor to the government. Yep. He is a lawyer. He was a judge. This is the sort of person who ought to mediate in such things so that they don't get to where this one of ours got to. Mm. Mm. Unless, unless he's executing a, a script. Either which way, <laughs> this one, it doesn't matter which way he turns. He'll be at the center of this and he will not come out smelling nice. Mm. Yes, because that's his job. That's his job to convince the president and tell him, you actually this is not you shouldn't look at this thing this way. This mm. is how you should. Yeah. And long term view of this should be this, 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 this. I think the one example of somebody who seems to have no, known what to do and to advise well had been was one gentleman by the name of Amos Wako. Mm. You cannot be attorney general and traverse several governments. Mm, 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 <laughs> you know mm, how to play mm, your mm, game mm, well. Mm, mm, mm. He was a fantastic poker player. A he civil servant who can do that. Mm. That's somebody who really knows his hop, sk uh, hop skip and jump well. Mm. The other person who seemed to have known his job really well was somebody called Kanyotu. Man, that guy went through how many governments? Mm. Mm. Same position. And probably he seemed to grow in power. Now, that's someone who knows what he's supposed to do and is doing it well to the point where whoever comes into power realizes that uh, it's best to keep this person right where he is. He's useful. It's true. Because somebody who's been, sorry. Do you know it's possible that you'll see the next uh, kind of, the next steps? Because we are going to have to appoint a new chief justice, right? And the new chief justice will obviously be vetted by and interviewed by a panel that will comprise the Judicial Service Commission. Maybe the Parliamentary Service Commission will come in. They sit in the JSC anyway. This is where the chief, the, the attorney general will play a hand. And show the direction. You know, we've had a very bad mm -hmm. uh, chief justice in office. And we need to have, you know, we need to really um, bring the repute of the judiciary back on track. To where it should be. To where it should be. Mm. 
And this is where the games are going to be played. Again, again, there's something at the back of my mind. I do not know. Just this feeling that this is an attempt at completely getting to control the appointments that are coming up in the judiciary next. Have this Chief Justice <laughs> and judges of the Supreme Court of Kenya. We have to ask ourselves, that even if it is deemed an independent body, have they truly been independent? Because we've always said no. that he who controls the purse then essentially is in control, right? And if this is money that is going to the judiciary to get certain things done, and it doesn't actually come out with the speed and alacrity with which you would expect it to in order for them to get their things, then independent in this case is just a title independent uh, for all intents and purposes then does not r truly mean independent and everybody else who should be independent in their operations so long as they don't hold on to this power and this power that we talk about being decentralized devolved so long as that power of control of the purse still remains in one place that truly is who holds the power so independent for me it just looks like a title and it sounds nice to hear but in terms of function it really isn't mm. And that's what the Chief Justice has been complaining about. The first thing that happened in his tenure is budgets start getting slashed. Mm. One after the other. So anyway, we're coming to the top of the hour. CT, tell us today's uh, proverb. We will see what happens in the moves for BBI and the judiciary. The grasshopper, which was killed by the locust, must have been deaf. Must have been? Deaf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting you speak about lockers because in the next hour, let's talk about lockers, okay? Okay. Uh, we know that uh, we have billions and billions of blue blistering barnacles uh, of locusts in oh, the country. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> in this country right now, um, has a huge impact on our food security. So let's talk to the person in charge of our food security. We'll be speaking to the principal secretary in, of, for agriculture in the Ministry of Agriculture, mm -hmm. Livestock and Fisheries, all right, in the State Department of Agricultural Research. This is Professor Hamadi Boga. Speaking to him in the next hour, talk about food security. Look at the impact uh, the, the locusts might have. Good morning. It's 8 o'clock. This morning is Mombasa Road trying to get into the CBD chocker block situation there, bumper to bumper after bumper, really. And uh, it will take some time from what we see all the way from Mlolongo to the JKI turn off even further down as you're approaching General Motors after Cabanas. So that's what we see today. It is taking some time to get through that. Everywhere else seems to be moving along smoothly. Thicker Road is not too bad this morning. Get to the CBD in good time. So let's keep an eye on Mombasa Road and keep an eye for us also where you might see other issues. Let us know so we can spread the word to others. Spice FM KE, that's how you can reach us on Twitter. Let's know what you see and keep things moving this Thursday morning. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, so deep, we have been controversial. About In the room, then, we have... Um, COVID happened, and the story of Locker sort of took a backseat. We stopped sending photos to the agriculture ministry so they can tell us whether this is a locust or a grasshopper, <laughs> as uh, we had been advised by, by the previous CS. We saw the new CS come in, uh, Peter Munya, and you know say that dedicating a lot of money and resources and hands on deck in fighting COVID. We've seen the deployment of the military in some areas to help in fighting COVID. Scientists and researchers from the region have come together and dealing with this entire uh, menace that is called locusts. 
um, we know where the locals have been coming from. So initially, the locals were coming from you know those sides of Oman, coming into Somalia and breeding through Ethiopia, got into the country, and then. When they got here, they also did what they were supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. which is what every living being does, procreate. New swarms of locusts that are homegrown have uh, started in this country, and we have now billions of them in the country, and they've been trying to move out. What this does, basically, is it raises the issue of food security because the people who are affected, the farmers in those areas who th uh, that have been affected, in terms of uh, growing their food, in terms of uh, fodder for their livestock. We're looking at areas which uh, have a lot of uh, livestock production as the mainstay of the communities, and then other areas where there's agriculture and food production as a mainstay of communities. Mm -hmm. Food security for them is impacted. Before the locusts came, there already were programs to try and boost and cushion them in terms of food security, because these are areas that are also perennially also food insecure. Now, can you imagine that whole uh, issue of uh, ensuring food security in these particular regions of the northeastern parts of the country being ravaged by locusts, billions and billions of them? What is, that hap what is happening to, to those communities? What's going to happen after these locusts leave? Uh, what is it that we are doing as a government in terms of our food security, uh, implementation of our food security policy. Again, just like every other thing, eh, in Kenya, we have a very lovely food and nutrition security policy. Mm. Oh, <laughs> lovely. A good one. Implementation of that, uh, we also need to question that. We have seen that there are reforms that the Ministry of Agriculture has been pushing in terms of now food security, looking at um, staple food of maize and in in increasing other cereals as well into this basket looking at how we manage the National Cereals and Produce Board. We spoke to a man in charge of um, uh, the man who chaired the committee that was proposing those reviews and what they have in mind. Today, let's speak to the Principal Secretary in the State Department of Crop Production and Agricultural Research. This is uh, Professor Hamadi Boga. Uh, Professor, good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? We are well, thank you. Welcome to the Situation Room. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, Prof, let me just uh, give a bit of uh, your background. You, uh, yes. you were the founding vice chancellor of the Taita Taveta University. And uh, yes. you, you, you are an expert in uh, mi microbial ecology of insect guts, soils, and soda lakes. Yes, yes. Insect guts. Yes. What is... <laughs> 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 yes, yes. W what is that? That means uh, the digestive system of insects. Mm. <laughs> this includes. And, uh, I, 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 and I specifically specialized on uh, on termites. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and termites, uh, apart from apart from fungi and uh, micro microorganisms in the soil. Yep. Termites are responsible for the highest turnover of biomass in the savannas. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the savannas, for example, you see the elephants. Yeah. But the real ecosystem engineers are the termites. Mm -hmm. So the impact on the ecosystem is bigger than, the bigger than that of, of the elephants. All herbivores, of all herbivores, not just elephants. When you say that they're the chief engineers <laughs> and the ones in charge of that <laughs> habitat, <laughs> Professor, please give a little more detail because this is very interesting. What, it, what is it that they do that gives them this wonderful position that they have? That, you, know, you know, I know in school you learned about the carbon cycle. Mm -hmm. So if the carbon does not cycle, then you, you have these uh, problems that you, you see about climate change and so on and so forth. The, the, the climate change issues are caused by destabilization of the carbon cycle. Mm -hmm. So in the carbon cycle, the termites in the savanna play a very crucial role. If you put a piece of wood in the savanna and kill all the termites around it, you will find it there 50 years down the line because the only organism with a machinery to break that down mm. is the termite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that is a conversation for another day. <laughs> a big one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about yeah. food security. You are the PS uh, in charge of uh, crop production and agricultural research. 
Yes, yes. When we talk about food security, the first thing that we think about is um, uh, crop production, of course, and livestock as well. Yes, yes. We have a very lovely uh, food and nutrition security policy. Yeah. We've been seeing some, a couple of reforms, but this yeah. country is still food insecure. Yes, uh, this country is uh, 25% food insecure. We are able to produce 75% of our own food mm. with a population of 40, 47 plus million. The number of really food insecure Kenyans is below 10 million. Mm -hmm. So when I say we are 75% food insecure, those are the facts and that is the reality. And so in the Big Four agenda, we have a number of targets that were set by His Excellency the President. One of those uh, targets is to reduce the number of food insecure Kenyans by 50%. So when we look at the numbers and the distribution of the food in secure Kenyans, you find a large majority of them are in northern Kenya mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah, no, northern Kenya, northeastern there, so and also north mm -hmm. northwestern. And our program, mm -hmm. we have uh, quite a number of programs that are targeted in that area. We have a portfolio with World Bank uh, for the NEDI counties uh, across sectors that is meant to change the circumstances there in northern Kenya. And this portfolio with the World Bank is uh, targeting the issues of schools and education, the issues of infrastructure, the issues of clim Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture, which we run here in the ministry under the Kenya Climate Smart Agriculture program. We also have portfolios uh, supported by the African Development Bank, on drought resilience livelihood support program all of them targeting North, northern kenya we also have portfolios under the small irrigation value addition project mm -hmm. also all of them targeting northern kenya so there's a lot of work going on uh, right now uh, started about two years ago and it will go on for the next five years it's not an event that you can switch on and switch off food security <laughs> You have to plan and work systematically towards the, the attainment, and that is what we are doing. So essentially, when you talk about um, food security, then we're looking at the ability to provide, basically putting food in the mouths of, of, of Kenyans. That's what we are saying specifically food security is about? Food security is a very broad issue. Mm. Uh, the way we see it in the ministry, in our recently launched... Uh, agriculture sector transformation and growth strategy is that number one our food production system we have to understand it all of us properly and understand the issues that are, ch are challenging it mm. 85 percent of our production is smallholder production mm. so we have und to understand the issues that are challenging uh, smallholder production so we have a whole anchor uh, in the strategy that deals with smallholder farmers, and our biggest outcome in that, and it's part of the outcome of the big four, is to increase the smallholder farmer income. Mm. What makes the smallholder farmer struggle mm. with income? Yep. Why are they still in poverty? Because so long as they are in poverty and they're giving up, then it undermines our food security system True. because 85% of it is reliant on the smallholder farmer. Mm -hmm. So we have two pillars in, in, this, uh, in this strategy that deal with the smallholder farmer. And uh, pillar one is basically to look at the ecosystem around the smallholder farmer. What do they need in their ecosystem for them to thrive? And we have, uh, we, 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 we have identified what they need what they need are input suppliers. What they need are mechanization service providers. Mm -hmm. What they need are off-checkers. What they need are processors in their neighborhood. What they need are post-harvest uh, handling facilities. Yep. So our strategy is to create SMEs around these needs of the smallholder farmer, but also to focus on organizing the farmer because they are small. The only way they can have a voice and be relevant and to, to, to get their issues sorted out is if they are organized. And that is why we are also investing a lot on farmer organization or what we call producer organization. Mm. So all our programs are value chain based programs 
that are working with farmers together with the counties to create this ecosystem to sustain production. Mm. A smallholder farmer on their own out there is like a gazelle walking through the Serengeti <laughs> without the, the security of other members of the of the clan of that gazelle. So we need the smallholder farmers to be organized. Mm. And, and that is where most of our effort is going. Mm. And if you had in the eight points plan uh, of the, His Excellency the President, in the ministry, we used to have a big program on fertilizer, but which was abused. Mm -hmm. And we have reformed that, and uh, we have moved towards e voucher And the e voucher works very well with this ecosystem, because it means you have to register the agrovets, you have to register the farmers, and you have to register the other service providers, so that the farmer, if they are being supported 40% by the government, mm. Uh, on, 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 on the services they need to carry out production, you are working with non-stakeholders that are supportive of the, of the, of the farmer with, a, with, a, with a, an expected output that is co-designed. And we are able to monitor mm. the farmer because most of the time in the first, you would give the fertilizer to NCPB, somebody would buy it, you would know the person, but you are not even sure whether they are farming or they are going to resell it mm. at a cheaper price. Yeah. And so in the end, uh, we could not monitor the effectiveness of our own program. But with this, the farmers are geotagged, so we can see the farm, even from uh, satellite imagery, we can see whether production is going on, and we can see even with the current uh, power of satellites, you can see whether the farm is doing better. It's actually doing better than that, before. That, 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 than before, because you mm. have uh, a history of production in the farm anyway. And in future, we can keep records of all this and see whether our interventions are, are, are making an impact and on the farmer impact. instead of uh, yeah instead of just uh, Who throwing is money charged with farm. ensuring that these wonderful policies are actually implemented in the counties? In the counties, we, we are working, of course, with the governors and the CECs, and for all our programs, we have a national steering committee and we have a county steering committee. And uh, it, uh, in the first five years of devolution, it was a bit of struggle because of push and push, mm. push and pull. Mm. But right now we have found a mechanism. Push, push and push. push. <laughs> <laughs> it was push and push, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. But, but uh, it, is, it is working. I think uh, we, we just have to realize that as Kenyans, we have a common vision. Mm. which has been set out by His Excellency the President of Food Security, which is a powerful vision. Every country should be able to feed itself. And if we focus on that, the other issues are secondary. P Professor, tell us this. If this policy is working, what picture yes. should we see around the country? And after how long? I think uh, if this, uh, this, uh, this uh, policy is working, and it will work, it has to, we have to make it work because we don't have a choice. We have a population which is growing and it needs to be fed. And if it doesn't work, that means we, we have to we then get food from somewhere else. If it is working, we, 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 want, we, we will see a proliferation of uh, service providers around the farming communities. And uh, they will be improving their own income as well as their interaction with the farmers we will see an increased income for the farmers. We will see increased production. Let, let me give you an example. Mm. When I look at the map of uh, maize production in this country, mm. I'm mentioning maize because it is an emotional crop and a political one for that matter. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you see a lot of emotions around maize, which is okay because it's a major staple. Mm. But uh, if you look at the production, uh, the farmer is doing an average of two metric tons per hectare. Our counterparts in Ethiopia, just by uh, rejigging the way they interact with the farmer, have raised it to five metric tons per hectare. Mm -hmm. wow. and, and so our biggest struggle is to get the farmer to produce more mm -hmm. on less acreage. Yeah. That way they will, get, they will earn more, there will be more food. Right now, the tendency has been, it is declining, and largely because of the way the farmer is interacting with the soil. Our policies in the past of giving DAP have partly contributed to the problem of the soil health. Mm. And so 
with our interaction and with the new programs and the conversations that we are having, like in the e one of the primary things is to do soil testing before you buy the fertilizer. Mm. So we, very soon we will have a soil testing service provider um, on board it to make sure that the farmers we are interacting with have their soil tested. Only 8% of Kenyans um, test their soil. The rest just buy any fertilizer. And that, I can tell you for sure, is hurting the soil, yeah. is hurting productivity, and is hurting the incomes of the farmers. And this is a conversation of also capacity building, awareness raising. Some of the things that we have to do are, are, are soft issues, but they are key issues in the production system. What exactly... Within this policy, is the government committed to doing to ensure that farmers can actually find competitive markets for their produce? Because this has been a problem for the longest time. I think I think the the, the problem of, of of markets is I, I agree with you is a, is a, is a thorny one, but it's it's not a difficult one because if we are food insecure to an extent of uh, 25%. Mm. Uh, it means the market is there because the market is you and me. We want to buy this maize mm. and we want to buy these commodities because uh, our lives uh, depend on it. And we have the purchasing power behind it. The problem of the market, I think we have to rethink the way uh, the, 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 the market is structured and we are, we are, we are doing that. Mm. There are a number of uh, agri-tech companies that have uh, proliferated and they are increasing, and we want to put our focus on there. I'm talking about companies like uh, Trigger Foods, uh, yeah. uh, which, which, is, uh, which, is, which started its business about three years ago. What they do, they contract their farmers. So the farmer grows knowing I'm growing for Trigger Foods. Yep. So, uh, and then Trigger, and they, and they respect the contract. Okay, mm-hmm. so what we are trying to do is talk with the millers for maize because mm-hmm. that is where the biggest problem is mm-hmm. to contract uh, the farmers already because yeah. they, they, the millers they, they consume about 30 million bags. Okay, mm-hmm. and uh, so if uh, there are farmers there who are able to produce these 30 million bags and they are contracted by the, 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 the millers. Already that market problem is solved, and so we want to encourage it to go in this direction. Uh, the challenge, when I ask the millers, where is the challenge? Why can't you do this? This is a no-brainer. At least you will know your farmers. You will know they are producing for you. You will know they are um, engaging in good agricultural practice. You can even monitor the issue of aflatoxin yep. properly. Yep. So I think this is a space where we are going to really push a conversation uh, but a business conversation, because as a government, our, our, our role is to provide an enabling environment for business uh, to thrive. But there must be and something, so, Professor, that has made the millers not venture into this. I mean, they have seen it happen. They've seen sorghum growers, tobacco growers are contracted. Ex- exactly. And yet I the think, millers think, have not ventured into this. There must be something that is uh, has been hindering no, no, I think in, I think in the past what happened is uh, they would go into contract and then uh, the, the, the people down there, because of the high demand, would find somebody with a better price and they would sell it. So where the, 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 the contracts are not respected and you have already made initial investment, mm. then uh, that is what has been discouraging. But I think this is a space if we push just a little bit yep. and with the registration of farmers, I think we can restructure that sector. This is a big problem, especially for maize. Mm. Uh, but I think for for the other value chains, the other the, the the other issues can be sorted probably differently. But this looks like a, a low hanging fruit that just needs conversation and uh, policy guidance, which we are ready to do. Talking of uh, policy guidance, uh, there has been talk, uh, a great deal of talk about how it is that the importation of certain key staple grain into the country also impacts on these local farmers and their produce and their marketing of the produce. Is this a statement of truth or is it just, as I said, conversation that people are having? No, it depends on how it's done. It depends on how it's done 
I think in the past, uh, the way we have done it has impacted negatively on the uh, on the farmers. Mm. And uh, when we came in, we were determined to to correct that in a certain to a certain extent. There are two commodities where this happens, eh? uh, where uh, uh, we, we, the ministry is uh, sort of heavily involved. Uh, the first one, of course, is wheat. Uh, we produce uh, about 3 million bags of, of wheat. Eh? Yep. And we consume about 12 million bags of wheat. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we have a, a regime which was uh, established when His Excellency the President was uh, Minister for Finance. And it has been working we- very well. Where the farmers and the millers negotiate, the country needs wheat. We mm-hmm. can only produce three million bags. Mm-hmm. The rest we have to import. Mm-hmm. But we have to have importation arrangements that do not impact on the farmer. So we only allow them to import after they have agreed with the farmers on the price they are going to offtake the local wheat. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the the release of importation permits is tied to offtake of local wheat. And so by the time the end of the year is done, the local wheat is, uh, has been taken up and, uh, the, and the, the imported wheat is uh, also flowing in, in a steady way to yeah. assure food security. Yeah. So for one bag of local wheat, we import another five because of the demand. Uh, and uh, we are looking whether there is possible possibility to upscale local wheat production, but as you know, wheat is a uh, is a cold uh, is a as a crop for cold environment. So other countries have a more competitive advantage. So if you look at our production costs for wheat, they are about three thousand shillings or thereabout. That means the farmer is pushing for a price of. 3,500, 3,200. So usually it's a big struggle. I've started in some of these negotiations. Mm. But imported wheat comes here at about 1,500. So you can see the, 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 the difference. Basically other countries, mm. other countries have a competitive advantage as far as uh, wheat production is concerned. It's concerned. That's, just a, that's just a scientific uh, fact. I can appreciate the difficult conditions um, that... Uh, may, 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 maybe, maybe you allow me to talk about the maize one. Mm-hmm. Yes, please. Uh, because maize is, uh, as I said, our spiritual crop. Huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so with the importation of maize, in the past we would import duty-free and it would come here at 2,000 shillings. Mm-hmm. If we import it duty free and we have bought it uh, at a time when the when the market is, is right, people are harvesting in Latin America or South Africa, it would come here at two thousand shillings or even less. Mm. Uh, the production cost in other countries is very low. But if we follow that production cost again and we import, the local farmer will not be able to compete because the production cost locally are about two thousand two hundred. Part of it is because of the low productivity. Yeah. Uh, I told you about two metric tons per hectare. Mm. While in Mexico and U.S., they are doing 12 metric tons per hectare. So they just, per hectare, they have a competitive advantage. Yeah. So this time we said, okay, uh, how much should we, t- how much duty should we put on, on to maize to enable the local farmer to be competitive? So this time when we said we allow for 2 million bags importation, we put a duty of 14% on it because we knew if we put a duty of 14%, it will arrive in Mombasa at around 3,100 there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 3,000 is a good price that the farmer are comfortable with. So the local maize farmer is not disadvantaged and the, the country has food because right now as we talk, most of the food uh, that was, uh, most of the maize that was available for millers is done and the harvest season has not arrived. Yeah. So we start harvesting around August. So we, we and we allowed the window of importation latest by 30th, 31st of July, so as not to interfere with the season. The so that way we secure the the, the consumer, and uh, we protect the farmer, and we make sure that the country has food. So it's a question of the willingness on our part mm. to look at the numbers 
to look at the numbers of production and to have a solid food balance sheet that we are tracking to see whether we'll have food throughout or whether there will be a shortage and when that shortage will be and to be disciplined in the way we import. This time we said government should not import. Government has no business importing food. If I may ask, uh, Professor, I mean, just as... Instead, uh, uh, the millers, uh, mm. inst- instead the millers themselves import. Even this time around we said no traders because the traders would add another cost. They would import and then sell to the millers. Mm. In this case, we said let the millers be the ones importing because they are the ones facing the shortage. Mm. Okay, Professor, and I, I think we've looked at importation as a solution in a lot of a lot of cases, and we can appreciate the difficult conditions under which uh, we need to then plant and harvest, right? Yes. Is it the solution, or and I can understand these conditions that we talk about hectareage and being able to harvest per hectare, and and, and thus when we compare with other countries. Are there not, what would be the problem? What's that thing that's stopping increased production? And can it not be looked at as a solution um, instead of going towards the importation um, um, option every time? And I'm talking about future, not just now. Uh, I think, I think uh, the, the, the solution is still in the SDGs, yeah? the agriculture sector transformation and growth strategy. We have other pillars there. The pillar we have talked about is the smallholder pillar. Mm -hmm. We have another pillar which is creating large-scale farms. Right. You know, in the past, after independence, because of attachment to land and because our independence was about land, we went into creating settlement scheme, which meant subdividing large parcels of land, which I think uh, was a mistake Mm. in, in that sense, because now it's undermining our food security. Mm. So we want to now, using Pillar 4, Pillar four to go back into large-scale farming by creating around 500,000 acres, opening up 500,000 acres to commercial production. And uh, this is, uh, again, because land is another spiritual issue, it's uh, <laughs> a conversation that we need to have with the communities, with the counties, and ourselves in the national government. So in the next two months, we'll place before cabinet a paper to see opening up of large-scale farms, uh, including the Galana Kulalus and other large-scale farms that are owned by public institutions that are currently not being used for production. So that is the, 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 the plan that is in, in place. And we think with the large-scale production, if we can increase it to about uh, 40%, not uh, the 14% that we have now, mm. we will be able to bridge this gap. Large-scale production is commercialized and it's efficient and they are able to reach higher productivity levels than uh, small-scale farmers. Mm. And I think this is something that is doable when we talk with the large-scale farmers. They are keenly, they, 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 are, they are clear that uh, they, they can, uh, they, what they need is the land, mm. what they need is uh, good financial arrangements with banking institutions where the interest is, uh, is, is not uh, like uh, for real estate or for other, <laughs> for other kind of commercial undertaking. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, moderated at a lower level. And the security requirements have nothing to do with like uh, having a title for the whole land otherwise, so that they have flexible arrangements the way they have in other countries. Mm. And then the other thing is having superior genetics. Because part of the productivity gap, you can bridge that by having the right genetics. And uh, the large-scale farmers feel outside there, they are superior genetics than we have access to right now. And that means working with Calro and Kefis to access these uh, superior genetics much faster. So superior livestock breeds and superior maize varieties or wheat varieties or sorghum varieties. And this way we'll bridge this. And uh, I think this is something that we can do in the next one year, comfortably open up like 50 such farms. And once we have known how to do it, we can continue expanding. And we'll, of course, we'll hold, been you to that. we'll hold you to, to that, we'll, 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 we'll do it, we'll yes, do it. Within we'll the next it. one year. <laughs> We have been we'll promised things. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we'll do it. It's, it's just a way of uh, working in a systematic way yeah. and uh, persuading people 
that the solutions that are being on the being put on the table are practical mm. and they they are feasible and all we need to do is get all stakeholders to understand and buy in and to understand that our survival and our food security will depend on doing things differently right and not continuing with business as usual let's talk about locusts now um the professor yeah. uh we know that uh, we we are expecting that uh, around now this time june july a fresh wave of locusts like that's going to be over 20 times bigger than what we've seen before will be uh, crisscrossing the country what is it that the government the ministry of agriculture is doing in uh, fighting the locusts and also uh, addressing the food security of these communities that have been impacted by the locusts no we we the locust came like uh uh like uh, it was an explosion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the beginning, around November, we started uh, having this prediction. Yep. And uh, uh, we started having these uh, predictions, and uh, we started seeing the locust heading towards uh, East Africa. Mm-hmm. Towards East Africa, and uh, you know, the locusts have not been here in the last seventy years. Yep. Okay, so yep. it's not a pest we are familiar with. Mm-hmm. In the ministry, we have a small unit called the Plant Protection Services Department. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It has about uh, maybe 10 people mm-hmm. who are familiar with the locusts because we are always fighting the tree locusts in uh, in Turkana and northern Kenya. Yeah. Mm-hmm. These, these are domesticated species. Mm. So when we heard that this time around the locusts would come, we started preparing, we bought the the chemicals required, we talked to the Desert Locust Control Organization of East Africa, mm-hmm. which, uh, which, uh, which has the mandate of controlling locusts across the region. But when the wave came, it was so big mm-hmm. that we realized uh, this is... Um, a biblical wave of locusts that we had <laughs> never seen before. Mm. And so countries and organizations like FAO who have experience with locusts quickly came in. So we formed a very strong coalition mm. with FAO, with DLCO, with World Bank, with the African Development Bank and our own Ministry of Agriculture, yeah. Livestock, Fisheries and Cooperatives to form a, a formidable team together with the counties that were impacted mm. to, to do surveillance because they, to control them, because they are migratory pests, it means you have to do surveillance. Yeah. And that means you have to train people on the ground, which we did. Mm. We had now to have a serious supply of chemicals, more than we had budgeted for, because the initial budget from the government was about $500 million, but the waves were just too big and too many and too scattered. I think at one time when we were looking at the surveillance, almost half of Kenya or three quarters of Kenya had these locusts in one way or the other. Yes. But but I, I think the interventions of working with local communities, counties, the government itself, international organizations, and the coordination that we were able to put in place meant that we could track, we could spray, we could uh, we could continue training and making sure that communities are prepared. Mm-hmm to deal with this uh, menace. Uh, we also appreciate the private sector because uh, the, the pesticides are usually provided by the private sector. Even in the COVID kind of em- environment where we were facing challenges, we still managed to get some of these chemicals. We also got a lot of chemicals from FAO and other donations from uh, China and other countries, mm. uh, which has meant that we are keeping things under control. Mm-hmm. We've had now two generations. Mm. The first generation hatched and flew, and uh, the second generation is now hatching. Because every intervention that we do, you kill about maybe 60, 70 percent. Mm-hmm. 30 percent still escape because some of the territories that have been there are vast. Mm. If locusts go and lay eggs in Suguta Valley, which they have, there is no way you are going to go there. So you have to wait for them to start flying to deal with them. Some of these areas are very insecure. Areas like Mandera, you know, there with Al-Shabaab. Areas like Garissa, Wajir, all of them are problematic areas. So like the spray helicopters or even the spraying planes cannot fly there because for them to spray, 
we have to fly at the level of a tree for them to spray the chemicals. So we avoided going to mm. those areas. Uh, instead, we, we gave local people the the equipment for spraying, but that is usually not enough. So, Professor, just so, moving, moving the conversation along. So we now yeah. have this second wave, which uh, is obviously larger than the first one. Yeah. And it's across the country. Now, uh, the question specific is uh, to food security for the people. First of all, dealing with this current larger swarms of locusts. And two, what it's doing to the communities and what the government is doing to help the communities. L let me correct you on that. The second wave is smaller. Oh, is it? L yes, much smaller. Because we have done a lot of work uh, containing. The first wave was in 28 counties. This wave is in three counties, mm. Turkana, uh, Marsabit, and Samburu, mm -hmm. right at the corner. And uh, right now it's in, this, it's in different stages. There are hoppers which are crawling and eating and trying to grow into, into adults. And then we have some adult uh, swarms which have started fledging. Fledging means shedding their skin, mm. readiness to take flight. But we know they won't fly immediately because they have to increase their body mass and store enough energy to enable them to fly across the, to Ethiopia and all the way to, the, to, to, to Pakistan and India. Mm. And uh, so we have an international obligation to continue the control and surveillance measures which we are doing. And right now there's a team on the ground seriously spraying and controlling both ground and aerial spray in Turkana, Samburu, and Marsabit to minimize as much of them as possible, as much of them as we can reach, so that uh, they don't go into Sudan or Ethiopia uh, and all the way to Yemen again and cause havoc there. And then, uh, if if we are not able, if they are not able to control them there. October, November, when the winds turn, mm. we'll have another invasion, which we are also trying to avoid. So um, this is a collaborative effort mm. scattered across the countries to make sure that things are brought under control. Do you, think that, this reason, can, mm, do you think that this will actually be, be managed this time around, uh, Professor? Because even if it may be in fewer counties, according to the same FAO, they're looking at, yeah. even if it's in a number of counties, in terms of the actual number of pests, possibility yeah. of them being larger than the first is actually quite great according to FAO yes, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we interact with FAO mm. and sometimes maybe the way they communicate some of the messages get uh, mixed up mm. you know every locust produces about 300 eggs mm -hmm. so if we if if we had not done any measures to kill the 70 percent that we did mm it would have been 300 times larger. So mm -hmm. we are not th seeing that scale. Okay. Instead, we are seeing a more reduced scale, of course, intense for Turkana, because Turkana did not have those levels mm -hmm. at the beginning, yeah. but because their geography and their soil, terrain, and texture is a very suitable habitat for breeding. So you see these masses in Turkana. And when I talk to the governor, I can see his uh, distress because he's saying they are walking all over Lodwa town. But mm -hmm. I think the interventions that we are doing together and uh, the scaling up of the operations around Turkana, Marsabit, and Samburu will uh, will manage most of this before before in, in the next two to three weeks. And then we see whether whether elements also help because uh, some of them you will not be able to reach mm -hmm. just because of the remoteness of the places we are talking about. Okay. These places are very remote. And uh, they are half, uh, Marsabit and uh, Samburu and, uh, and, uh, and, and Turkana is almost half the size, uh, half of Kenya, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at the, the, the scale of uh, operations there. And uh, the, the team has been working since uh, January, mm -hmm. non-stop, to manage this menace. And they have done a good job. And we are confident that we have this thing under control. Something that I find intriguing, um, how is it that you determine the migratory patterns of these locusts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, what we have done is that we have trained the local scouts to use uh, 
an app called Elo Castriem, which was developed uh, by FAO together with uh, a university in the U.S. And uh, once they take a picture of locusts in a particular locality and load some details, the data goes direct to FAO and to the ministry. And that data of that surveillance data, together with the rainfall data, together with the wind movement data, is used now to using a model that FAO has developed to show you where next the uh, locusts are likely to head if not managed. So that way we have been using that uh, those surveillance maps. I think uh, I can share with you some of the maps mm. if you give me your, 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 your numbers so that you see that technology has really been helpful in uh, in guiding the intervention, both surveillance and control and reporting. So uh, what we have are forecasts that come from FO every week so that we can send resources where they focus is most uh, likely to happen. And those maps have been perfect. Those maps have been very perfect, and they have really guided these interventions to avoid wasting resources in areas where the, the locusts will not uh, go. Let's conclude the conversation, Professor, with the, the question on uh, food security. It's securing uh, the communities that were affected by these locusts. What yeah. interventions are the government put in place? I think uh, we have programs in all these uh, places, uh, and uh, there is a study that is being done by Red, uh, Red Cross, which will inform our own intervention. And uh, there are various actors who are already intervening in this space, because, again, just the way the, the fight for the locusts was a multi-stakeholder fight, the fight to rebuild the livelihoods also has to be multi-stakeholder. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like I said, we have various programs uh, from ourselves in the ministry, from our partners in World Bank, from FAO, from uh, other NGOs acting on the ground. Okay. And the idea, once the Red Cross concludes the study and we have identified the most impacted communities, we think there will be like 12, 13 counties then livelihood support programs will come in uh, to support the communities to rebuild and to be resilient. Yeah. I think these communities uh, are the ones that uh, where the most food insecure Kenyans are, like you said in your opening statement. And even without the locusts, we still have to continue intervening in these places mm. so that they come to the same level of food security like the rest of the country. Okay. Asante Sana, Professor Hamadi Boga for speaking to us. Uh, Santa, 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 Santa. Professor is a principal secretary in the State Department for Crop Production and Agricultural Research. Have a good day, Prof. I hope one time we can have a conversation about insect gut. Yes. <laughs> we we'll, would we'll love for you to come and actually... It's intriguing in the title alone. I think we need to get into uh, it more. Actually, we actually would like you to come and physically have this discussion with us in the with studio. With us, yeah. I'll be happy to do that. I'll I, be happy to I have a that. gut feeling it'll be an interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's a quarter to nine. This is the Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Let's take a look at traffic. The conversation continues. All right, so uh, just right now, traffic is crazy from Mombasa Cement all the way to the JKIA turnoff. It's still quite crazy on Mombasa Road, unfortunately. Road check shows you that you might spend a little bit more time there trying to get out of that situation and then on towards the CBD. Right around the Nyao Stadium roundabout, however, there is some traffic from all directions coming in from industrial area, coming in from Langata Road, Mombasa Road, and then on towards Uru Highway. It's going to take a little bit of time. The Southern Bypass experienced a couple of accidents this morning, and so um, you want to approach with caution, but it should take you through okay the eastern bypass as well this morning is bumper to bumper traffic in some areas but it shouldn't be too bad if you're using that as an option getting into the cbd from thicker road this morning um it's a bit slow and um the service lanes however are moving a little bit faster so there's an option for you if you're stuck somewhere shouldn't last too much longer in terms of craziness and traffic this morning we'll let you know what it looks like in a short while you can also share with us spice of M K E on twitter
like the person who has to do the charge, uh, take responsibility for implementation of all these very good plans that you know are being laid out on paper, just like everything else. They sound really, really good, you know. Talking about uh, working with farmers, improving this value chain, encouraging other players to come in so that the smallholder farmers can setting up the support system. Uh, that support system, all that, you know, on on paper, very good. It comes to implementation, and then start, people start looking at where can I play in this? Can I be the one who's doing the mechanization, or can I delay this so that I can basically? B- reap bigger rewards by doing one or the other. Hmm. You know, why you heard me ask that is because for mm. the longest time, yeah, with all the sugar factories we have in the country, we've never been able to produce enough sugar to meet the demand we have in the country. So there's always been need to import sugar. Now, one could ask for a better position when it comes to marketing your product because there's something in demand. Yep. And yet literally every government uh, uh, run sugar factory has closed down or is on his knees yeah. or is limping. And yet private sugar companies that were built much, much later seem to be thriving. They're doing okay. And yet, even with the Comesa rules and what have you, sugar importation seems to have even surpassed the quota that was laid out for them. So, hence that question because this is part of the agricultural sector. Mm. Okay? And what all this has meant is that the very farmer who's supposed to benefit from this particular product yep. is the one person who doesn't benefit from it. In fact, he ends up being impoverished. Indeed. Again, on food security for especially those uh, the northeastern parts of the country, the northern parts of the country now being ravaged by swarms of locusts. Uh, like the PS has said, in terms of Turkana, Turkana are seeing increased numbers because they've never dealt with these kind of numbers before. The governor of Turkana is calling the ministry all the time and saying, look, guys, uh, we need to see more and more interventions happening. This is impacting um, a lot of these communities in these areas, pastoralist communities, even those that are you know, moving into crop production, they're still now wondering, so why did I move into crop production if something can come and just decimate everything that I've tried to grow in the last couple of months? Mm. You asked the question, CT, on how they determine the movement of these animals. How is it possible that uh, we could have told these things are hatching in Oman and in a few uh, months' time, they will be in Kenya? And then from here, they are going to South Sudan or into Uganda or going or back into going Ethiopia. India. Mm. Or they end up in Pakistan, India and Pakistan. Let's speak to somebody who's actually a climate scientist now, all right? His name is Abubakar Babika. He's uh, with the IGAD Climate Center. Abubakar is here. He's uh, dealing so much with the locust invasion in the country and where the movement, not just in the country, but actually in the region, uh, from when they started crossing over from you know, Oman, Yemen, coming into Somalia, into Ethiopia, Kenya, and the region, uh, and now that whole movement, and the breeding and the multiplication of the swarms. Abubakar, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for speaking to us, Abubakar, and welcome to the Situation Room. Thank you very much for having me. You and good are morning to your station, to the, your audience. My, my colleagues here say good morning to you too. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> good morning. Abu Bakr, a climate scientist, let's just get, get into that question of, you know, the, uh, your prediction, how, how it is that you're able to predict the movement, the multiplication, and the impact of the locusts as they move around the, re- the region. Um, great. Yeah, we we are a climate center uh, belong to the intergovernmental organization uh, IGAT, and our main work is on climate forecast. But uh, when the desert locust uh, outbreak uh, is started uh, to impact the region, uh, we have the capacity uh, to pr- to produce weather forecast. and we also have technical staff who have the capability to uh, provide. A forecast for the desert locust. So we started to use a, the climate information or the information of weather forecast. For example, the forecast for the wind, uh, rainfall, mm. uh, temperature, uh, soil moisture, and we merge that with the information from satellite for, for the greenery. For example, the vegetation cover, 
because this is one of the factors that also control the movement of desert locusts. And uh, uh, one of my colleagues he developed this model to use uh, for for uh, for the desert locust forecast. So our main product is a climate forecast, but mm. due to the emergence of this uh, desert locust issue, we we moved into also forecasting desert locusts. Looking at what the situation is now, I mean, obviously you're over a great, uh, larger region, but with what is happening now, and of course the question is, how long is this going to be? How long is this um, going to continue to ravage uh, the country? And it's a concern for those who are keepers of livestock. It's a concern for those who are farmers. It's a concern for the general public, you know, of the country. Um, If you're able to predict their migratory pattern, are you able then to predict how long this menace is going to be here? Um, the 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 length of the desert locust is staying is of course uh, depending on the um, the controlling mission. How successful is the country? For example, if we are talking about Kenya or other country in the neighboring region, mm-hmm. this is one major factor. And I think Kenya is doing very well in in this domain, mm-hmm. as you have heard uh, on the speaker be- before me. He gave a detailed on how the, their controlling mission is working so far. So far, it is mostly in the northern Kenya and Turkana region. And the worry that it might migrate to the uh, to the northern part uh, or su- southern Sudan and maybe Sudan. Mm-hmm. So um, you, need, you need to control uh, locally and also watch out for the neighboring countries, what is happening in neighboring countries, because that might be also a risk for another outbreak to might come to Kenya also from other countries. Mm -hmm. Let me ask, the science of predicting the migration of locusts, would you say it's an exact science? Um, It's hard to say it is an exact science per se, but this is what we produce now. We call it a, an, a, like a projection because desert locusts are well known to move according to the climate and weather condition, and they also move according to the ecological condition, the vegetation cover, the soil moisture, and all this. So, but the, the issue is that you are modeling physical features like like wind and, and, and temperature and, and rainfall. Those are natural phenomena. You could predict them in, in, with a good accuracy. But then you have animal behavior that is also included in the picture. Mm. So what we do is we give a pro, uh, uh, like an inform, informative guess for what is the potential location. So then the controlling mission has to focus the effort there. And so far, actually, our product, it was the first, actually, mm. worldwide, I would say. Well uh, that is what was produced by God, yeah, Climate Prediction Center uh, in a way that used climate and, and, and satellite information to produce yeah. very accurate and, and good quality uh, uh, forecast for the desert locusts. Abu Bakr, let me ask the political question. As scientists, when you sit and you even come up with all these models and projections, and you pass the information on to the political actors in governments, do you feel like they act on your information immediately? For example, in this particular case of this uh, locust invasion? Yes, very well. They, they did act very well, especially in Kenya, I would say so. In some other countries, we actually produce this forecast for the whole region. Mm-hmm. And um, not only for Kenya, but for the whole region, our mother for the region. So some countries did respond in a in a like a speedy way. Some other countries, due to limitation, maybe in uh, financial resources or some issue of political instabilities, um, that maybe hinder the the action from the government side. But uh, for Kenya, from what I'm seeing and reading in the news, I think they have done very well. What would a good intervention look like? Like, for instance, in Kenya, we know that the government has been trying their level best to contain the locust, but we knew in advance that the locusts would might very well land in Kenya. What would a good intervention look like? A good intervention is that we really need a, a early warning system. And a, a problem like desert locust, it shouldn't be just a matter of one country. It's a, a regional issue because if a, a country, even if Kenya did everything, 
that is possible and uh, to control the other locals, there is still risk from what is happening in your neighboring country. Mm. So what is needed is that we have to strengthen regional institutes, for example, like Igat Climate Center uh, or at the Regional Center for Desert Locus Control. Those organizations have to be well-funded, well-supported, and they have to adopt the most recent and advanced technology in surveillance, identifying the problem from early stage and sort of anticipate it from early stage and, and we be prepared. That would be a more effective approach because it is not only a national issue. Even if you control your, at your country very well, you still uh, have that risk from uh, invasion from the neighboring country. Yeah. So a more regional effort is, is more needed, actually. Mm. Abu Bakr, thank you very much for speaking to us, and we uh, congratulate you on the good work that you're doing at the IGAD Climate Center. And especially now coming up with, uh, like what you're saying, the first tool uh, in the world uh, that was able to actually uh, collect and give data on uh, locust invasions. Thank you very much for having me, and we hope to communicate further. We have interest, actually, to share our information through radio because it is very effective in mm -hmm. reaching people mm -hmm. in rural areas. Mm -hmm. So we are happy to talk to you in the future in any relevant issues. Thank you Our very much. Our platform is open to you. Thank you, sir. Ker, asante sana, nashkuru. Coming up to 9 o'clock, the Situation Room. This conversation continues uh, on our social media platforms as well. CT Muga, today's proverb. The grasshopper which was killed by the locust must be deaf. Mm. Apt at this point. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dalili ya mvua ni mawingu. That's basically the, the simplest translation of this in Swahili. Uh, yes. Mm. Okay. As you say, forewarned is forearmed. Yeah, forewarned is forearmed. Mm. Coming up to 9 o'clock, the Situation Room continues. Remember, uh, we are live streaming on uh, www.spicefm.co.ke and also on our social media platforms, Spice FM KE on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Join the conversation as well on our Instagram handle at Spice FM KE. Good morning. Crazy on Jogo Road today, heading into the CBD via the City Stadium roundabout, heading into um, industrial area on your left or going then on your right towards the CBD. It is bumper to bumper, moving um, quite slowly this morning, but this expected for now. I don't think we had everything absolutely crazy this morning. Um, we should open up in a short while and we have a little while in case anything does pop up at you. Let us know, Spice FMKE, and we'll be able to share. Your life. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. Traffic. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room. Two minutes up to nine. This is The Situation debates. Room. It's Kenya's biggest conversation. Today is the second day of July. <laughs> Four days before we have, we expect to be told, fellow Kenyans, I have sat down with the think tank again, the Brain Trust. And the conversation, fellow Kenyans, as you know, is about uh, reopening the economy. It is not a conversation between two rights or two, a right and wrong. It's a conversation about uh, two rights. And the rights are here. 
So, a month, uh, almost a month ago, the president extended the lockdown restrictions by a further 30 days because the scientists and the medics who sat with him said, look, we are seeing an increase in the number of um, infections in the country, just from our tests, a small sample of people, higher number of positives em emerging. Yesterday, we saw this from 3,000 and uh, how many? 519. We had the highest number of daily infection announcements made yesterday, mm. over 300. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we are seeing that uh, governors and business community and everybody else is applying pressure on the president and saying, Mr. President, let the people, let go. my people go. <laughs> you know? People just want to live their lives. So this is a conversation between that uh, back and forth again, and we are back to that point. Should we reopen? Should we not reopen? To reopen or not? A story here in the nation is uh, pitting the two CASs in the Ministry of Health against one another. Uh, Professor Rashi, Dr. Rashid Aman and Dr. Mercy Mwangangi. The, this he says that CAS Rashid is warning of a spike in case uh, in cases should containment measures be lifted. But it says, according to this report, that Dr. Mercy Mwangangi has been saying is has been on record insisting that the counties are prepared and therefore the country is ready for reopening. <laughs> prepared for what exactly? <laughs> yeah, you got to put it into context, right? <laughs> to deal with. I mean, with is, is the good doctor the making a case, in the is, country? Is she making a political statement? Is it a ministerial statement, or is she talking as a doctor who has understood the facts? Or is the report quoting her in the proper context of what she meant? Every time she talks about, you know, we are seeing the counties are increasing their preparedness, or has she said the counties are absolutely prepared? Have we heard of that report being challenged? This one? Mm. Of, of this today's? Mm. We shall see. We shall see whether she actually chooses to challenge it or not. We know that the county uh, governors have been having these conversations with the president. The last conversation, they were talking about their preparedness in terms of what they had been told as a target. The reasonable minimums was have this number of beds per county being as uh, isolation centers, as isolation facilities, mm -hmm. they are at less than 30% of that. Yeah, last Thursday they made the announcement during this virtual meeting that they had with the president. Yep. And they talked about the fact that, okay, fine, we needed uh, 30,000 around the country. And as of last Thursday, they were at 6,898. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think 8,600. Right, somewhere there. Yeah. Okay, 86. So, um, so they didn't quite have enough and it was clear that you know they were making efforts according to them making efforts to be able to get certain things in place because the think tank said the only way that we're all we're going to be able to do this is to have certain things in place and i think that has come uh, out clearly now that it is not the case however the push and the pull and the desire to be out there is fueled by the fact that quite a number of people in terms of livelihoods then are not able to make it and i think the push and the pull, unfortunately, doesn't, interestingly enough, doesn't take into consideration COVID on her own here as this disease that is, that is uh, infecting people, right? Mm. The push and pull takes into consideration the effects of this disease. And to say that we need to go back, not because we don't worry about getting sick, but because we are not able to survive without being out yeah. there and doing business. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. That that reaction is not coming from, you know, um, not regarding the dangers that COVID poses, but it comes from the fact that people are regarding the dangers posed by staying home and not being able to go out there and work. And to be able to find a middle ground between the two, I think, is the very difficult task that these uh, task forces... Brain think trust. Tr brain trust mm. plus then have to have to deal with um i do believe that we're going to get to a place where certain things will be said all right here go ahead but then there are certain sectors which absolutely not um will be allowed to open or will be allowed to go to business as usual you know when the president spoke to us a month ago on the 6th of uh, june it was clear that there were two very 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 uh direct uh, statements that were being made by two groups mm. and the groups were those that were pushing for and were saying that let's reopen the economy mm -hmm. and those that were saying let's not reopen the economy mm. 
and their voices were equally strong. Mm-hmm. Professor Anzala said the moment. same thing. Mm. The, their voices were equally strong. And we are not talking about people who are, you know, at the, uh, everybody else. It's among the medics, among the people who are in charge of the National Emergency uh, Response Committee, and those who are sitting in the task force. People who have been dealing with the fight against COVID from all angles, sitting there and they are divided. There are those that say, it's okay, we can reopen. As long as we have created awareness and maybe the measures are still, other measures are in place, we can reopen. Mm-hmm. People will fight this thing. Others are saying, look, we still haven't seen the true colors of this disease in this country. We've not seen the worst. We haven't seen it yet. Yeah. We can see the numbers rising. Let's reach to a certain point where we are now able to say, all right, this is uh, where we are. Then we reopen. Mm. Now, that push and pull is about to happen again this weekend. Mm. What should we see? What, where do you stand? Well, I think we're still at a place. I think Kenya is still at a place where you're really not sure of what it's going to be. And this is coming from a combination of factors. I mean, we have now, um, from a report that we've seen today, for example, when it's you know the state has owned up to virus testing measures. And I'll make my point just in a bit. But here, it talks about the fact that the government has admitted that there were inconsistencies in COVID tests, even as the National Assembly sought to dig deeper into the possibility of some patients being issued with wrong diagnoses. Kiambu Central MP Jude Njomo told the National Assembly Health Committee that his late mother got a wrong COVID-19 diagnosis and had to be buried hurriedly at 8 p.m., only for her to be found out later that it was not the case. Okay, so this is shedding light on the fact that even here, there was a whole mess when it came to testing there was a whole other mess when it came to testing capacity there was a whole other mess now when it came to uh, uh, this information now fueling decisions i think that there are certain things that had to be covered that would then give way to decisions made and unfortunately some of those things have not been done I think on the other hand, there are some areas within which you can then say, let us do one, two, three. And there are some areas where absolutely do not even try it because of the fact that we've not reached a certain level, a certain threshold where we should be able to make certain decisions. I do think that there's going to be shared um, when, when, when we come around to the 6th of July. Mm. I don't think there will be a blanket, you know, complete on on everything i think there are certain things now where an allowance will be given and there are certain things where still it will be an absolute no because clearly we've not been able to meet it yesterday cs george magoha um for education talked about the fact that look just from the fact that we are we are not ready i don't he was clear now finally Mm. finally for the first time he has says we are very clear from where i am and we'll hear that the president will give us exactly where we're going to go but i have already and in, in, in taking this report, I am going to present it to him that I don't think schools should, should open, open yeah. before January. First but time, very did, clear on did that. The governors not also share that same exact view about, about schools. Reported, about Previously, schools. Previously, yes, yeah. they did. Yes. But so we see some clarity coming from but him. But the same finally governors are saying, say, open everything else, open markets, schools. open everything else. But surely, but not surely, 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 surely. How do you divorce the opening of schools and the activities around the school and students and what on earth are they saying? What do you mean? If you open up everything and you close schools, mm. all right? What do you think you will have achieved? You see, you are trying to minimize interaction that may put people in danger of being infected. Yeah. All right? The fact that you've closed schools does not mean that there will be no movement of children. Mm. One of the things that school does, it contains the children in should we call it a safe environment? Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, you open up the rest of the economy. Everybody mingles as they see fit. These people go back to homes where they are children. What exactly have you done? Have you not, you've it, endangered. In fact, you, it's worse. You basically said that everybody else can bring the disease to the children. Yes, yeah. exactly. Except for, for the yes, children. Exactly. Bring it, bring yeah. it to yeah. anybody else. Themselves. Mm. But more to the point, if you look at what's happening around the world, we are not going to be... Um, the first people to have this discussion or to even try. Countries where they have tried to open up the economy, they have all, without without any exception, engaged reverse gear. Mm -hmm. California had opened up, literally opened up. My goodness. And they 
had delegated the decision making process to their counties. Mm -hmm. They also have counties, smaller units of, 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 of the state. Mm -hmm. Goodness, they are shutting down everything all of a sudden. And what is worse, the spike is worse than what they had before. So you get the impression that in opening up the economy as they did or thinking about or actually doing it, what you'll have done, you may have actually lost the gains you had made with the initial position that you had taken. How about the countries that have gone about it uh, gradually? Who have staggered it. Yes. So you move from <laughs> point A to <laughs> point B. You find there's an issue. Either you pause in terms of delaying movement from point B to C, or you basically just take a step back. So you go back to A. Or if you succeed in going to C and find a problem at C, you don't come back to A, you come back to B. Right? So basically, if you look at them, Germany, they started reopening. Yes, they took a pause, but they continued with a push to reopen. Even Italy and Spain, they have started reopening. They are taking pauses, but they are reopening bits and pieces. UK, the same. They're taking a pause, but they're starting to reopen certain sectors of the economy. Was it uh, Ireland that we spoke to, the, the ambassador here, and she was telling us about their graduate, graduated reopening? Mm. They have started reopening. They have not gone back to that entire 100% lockdown. They are moving towards something. In this country, we, what are our restrictions? The cessation of movement impacts several things. One, movement into and out of Nairobi County which is like the center of the economy of the country, right? Everything else, uh, Nairobi and Mombasa, Kwale and uh, Kilifi were reopened. So movement into and out of Nairobi County and Mombasa County is what is in place. Movement after 9 p.m. and before 5 a.m. Is, is in place. Mm -hmm. During the day... Is it four? Or it's four. Four. Yeah. Mm. It's four, 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 yeah, four, four, four a.m. Yes, four. Mm. Nine and four. It's still in place. During the day, you are, so if we were to expect the president to reopen the economy as, as we speak, it is looking at those two primarily and then the other areas, travel. Are we saying that we are now allowing um, air travel, for example, across the country? They are Domestic. Country, you see, there are countries that are con not only considering it, mm. they've, they've set it in motion. You asked what happened with countries who've staggered it. Let me give the example of the UK mm -hmm. that I read about. Yep. <laughs> this is summer, is it not? It mm -hmm. is. So there are days that are particularly hot and people feel it would be a complete waste of time to stay indoors. Mm. Yeah. They cast caution to the winds and they filled the beaches. Failed. Now, if you look at pictures of those beaches, you, you, you can't even see any move, <laughs> you space for bodies. Mm. They're, they're genuinely full. So yes. It's like there are things the government will do and enforce but there's a point at which the citizenry will decide what they want to do. Mm. The people, yes. personal responsibility. They will decide that, okay, we've heard what you've said, but this is what we are going to do. Mm -hmm. And that really is where perhaps the real problem lies. We talked about um, carbon... Uh, Fever. Yes. Mm. And I think if you live in climates where uh, the hot season only lasts so long, and then you know very well that the cold season is just around the corner. Mm -hmm. You feel from practice, from habit, from culture that you want to take full advantage. So no law by the government is actually going to prevent you from doing from that. Doing mm. so. Yes. Now, has the UK made any announcement about clawing back on that reopening? Not that I have read of. This was not anything to do with them. Mm. People rushing to the beaches in large numbers. It was the people. It was not... The slight opening. Now, let me give you an example of what they put in place with regards to bars. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bars have been opened, but it is the duty of the bar owner or tender to take a list of every, every person who comes to that bar with contact details. Mm. So that should there be an issue about people being infected, you have a very clear idea of who was here, when they were here, and so follow-up can be made easy. Mm. Because it isn't just a decision they've made, Eric. They have mm. followed it up with the finer details of what else needs to be done to ensure that safety is maintained. So it's not just, we are okay, you're now free. Mm -mm. 
they're still fighting covid they're still observing yes, the other protocols yes. contact tracing is still in place yes um they're still advising people to observe physical distancing they're still saying that if you go into this place you shall have all these measures uh, that you've put in place physical distancing uh, hygiene observance of hygiene all those are still there mm. they're still in place it's just that you're allowing people to and they've added a bit more with mm. with allowing people to move they've mm. they, they've actually added a few provisions and said if you're going to do this this is what must also happen mm. if you're going to do this this must also happen now if we are thinking of even opening up this space a little bit what must supplement that particular opening as something similar Mm-hmm. In addition to this this must happen. But remember remember mm. this is a government I'm talking of the UK. This is a government that in addition to all these things they have guaranteed that they have given their people economic and financial support. Yeah. People who've lost their jobs they are getting a salary from the government. Yes they are. And yet the people still wanted to be let go. Yes. Now you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine <laughs> when uh, people were not being fed, people were not being given anything to tide over, and they still want to be let go. Yeah. Uh, 18 minutes after nine, let's look at weather, and then we'll open up this conversation. So what is it that we want the president to tell us come Monday, the 6th of July, 2020? Open the economy or don't open the economy? Are we ready to fight this COVID or are we not ready to fight this COVID by if we allow everything else to come back to resume back to normal good morning it's 18 minutes after 9 Cloudy conditions in Nairobi. You see highs of 23 today. And in Nyeri, uh, wet afternoon, cloudy conditions through most of the morning. Highs of 21 and lows of 13. Nakuru will see highs of 23 with rain showers later on. And in Elder today, highs of 20 and lows of 12 with showers in the afternoon. Kisuma, 22 degrees will be partly cloudy. Highs of 27 and lows of 19. Kakamega will have a wet afternoon with highs of 24 and lows of 16. Mombasa, at 28 degrees, the high will see lows of 23 and and mostly cloudy conditions. Light rain showers are being experienced in Malindi, 25 degrees, and the rain is likely to carry on through most of the day with highs of 28. And in Kampala, 22 degrees, we'll see highs of 24 and lows of 19 with showers in the afternoon. Dar es Salaam is experiencing shallow fog this morning, highs of 31 and lows of 22 with partly cloudy conditions in the afternoon. Johannesburg at 7 degrees is mostly sunny. Sunny conditions to prevail through most of the day with highs of 18 and lows of 4. All right, taking a look into Lagos where it's clear skies at 25 degrees, thunderstorms expected for the afternoon with highs of 29 and lows of 24. We'll take a look in Paris where it's mostly cloudy at 17 degrees, highs of 22 today. And in London at 14 degrees, partly cloudy conditions. The beachgoers might not be happy today because it will be highs of 21 with showers through most parts of the afternoon. And finally, for New York on this Thursday, highs of 33 and lows of 22 with partly cloudy conditions. So are we ready to reopen the economy or are we not? Are we ready to release these uh, restrictions that have been put in place by the government or are we not? Are you asking me? I'm asking everybody. No. Everybody. So City Muga, no, we are not. No. no, no. We continue where the way we are. Vocally. No, 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 definitely not. Nduoko? Not quite yet. Not yet ready? No, unfortunately. Okay. 0719 We'd like to know what you think. Let's go to Nakuru in Wakulima Market. Our friend Karyuki is there. Good morning, Karyuki. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you guys? We're Good, fine. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning. Are we ready to reopen the economy, Karyuki? I don't think. Nothing? Yeah. Not yet? I too don't think. In the first place, remember, hmm. I have you comparing the Kenya and uh, the rest of the European countries. Yeah. And especially the Spain. Yep. 
the Spaniards and the English and the Italians. Remember, in the first place, they were, it was locked down, isn't it? Yes. They were locked down. Mm -hmm. In our country, I don't think in, if there's anything to do with the lockdown. Yep. Just something similar to that. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think too late that we are supposed to open it. And if he is going to open it, then that means he is throwing his hand, telling us, oh, you are alone, Kenyan. I'm unable to contain it anyway. Mm. I do not think, I do not agree with anything to do with that. And if at all he's going to do it, then it's agree that we are, our own, we are on our own. <laughs> That's what I can say. That's the message you're getting. Okay. And especially city, city, you have said, sometimes I don't agree with you because sometimes you talk as if you, are, you have come from outside the country. Oh, city. So sometimes I don't agree with you. Mm. What I, I've been listening to this conversation since morning, and I truly really don't agree with what you're saying. Mm. Mm. So I don't think this country is ready. And point number two, remember when there was lockdown in the Indian country, and especially those who are developed ones, mm. remember, they give their people food. They locked it down and they give their people food, unlike our country, where we have been on our own anyway. Yeah. We are entering to a, 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 I mean, to a, a second kind of a, a, our a loneliness. If the president is going to open the economy, as you say. Thank you, so, Karyuki. Thank you very much, guys. What do you think? 0719-012-600. Are we ready to reopen the economy? Are we ready to remove some of these restrictions that we have in place? The restrictions that we have in place, just so we're clear. Okay, schools are closed. Mm -hmm. Fine. All right. Um, churches and religious organizations. Churches and religious organizations and places of worship closed. Those, that's a restriction in place. Movement after 9 p.m. and uh, before 4 a.m., there's restriction on that. Movement into and out of Nairobi, there's restriction. And the same thing with the Mombasa County, restriction. Flights within the country and internationally, there's restriction. But what else do you have? You can go to the market if you want. What else? Hotels have reopened. They've been allowed to reopen. They're considering uh, opening local flights. Yeah, so that's, that's still in place. So is that... Is, is opening up local flights, uh, are we ready for that? Hmm. That's what we want to know this morning, 0719-012-600. It's, it's, it's that position of a back and forth. They, and I think I just go back into when they had a meeting 26 days ago and they agreed that, all right, so for us to start talking about reopening, let's work backwards. In What do we need to do? The reducible minimums. This is what we need to put in place. Have we seen those measures being put in place? If we haven't seen those measures being put in place, then we, then should, be questioning, we, about? Yeah. we should be questioning the people who are responsible for that because they are the reason why we'll not be able to reopen. Mm. And those people should be held to account. In Back to Nakuru, Matthew, good morning. Good morning. How, how are, are you? Doing? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Hello, how oh. are you doing? Fine, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Babu. Habari yako kaka? Salamu sana. Uko mzima? Niko salama. Asante. Matthew, yes. should we now, reopen? Uh, are we ready to, for reopening? I, I, don't, I don't think we are ready to reopen. Mm. Why? Because uh, right now uh, we are experiencing the, the highest cases of laxity when it comes to people. You know, people have gotten to a point where just because you don't know anyone who is infected, you think that this thing is not with us. Mm. No. People have uh, gone to the point of wearing masks that just because cops are uh, are around. Yeah. No. <laughs> you know, I, I saw someone yesterday, sadly, uh, uh, when walking on the streets, I may wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Okay? Just because kwa street, I never kutana na askari. Mm -hmm. Then, akikuja kuingia kwa hotel in Mahali, anatoa yo mask, anawa mikono. You know, it doesn't even make sense. Mm -hmm. You know? You're getting into a place where you have uh, uh, the potential of infecting people. That is why you remove your mask. On the street, we were putting on your mask because utakutana na askari. Usishikwe. Mm. Usishikwe. You know. What is the law? And, and, and you see, when, remember on the 6th, when so, everyone had the hype. Uh, that are you saying, Matthew, open. are you saying, Matthew, that you shall believe that we are ready when everybody is wearing a mask everywhere they're supposed to wear a mask? No, 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 no. no. What I'm saying is, Remember back on uh, last month on the 6th when people had hopes that uh, the, 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 the country is going to be opened up. Yep. Everyone was in, in a party mode. Everyone relaxed. Uh, the, the caution that people were taking mm. was, thrown to the, to, was thrown to the wind. Mm -hmm. you know? 
and that is what people expect. You know, everyone is waiting for 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 a, for, for, for a lift of uh, the the curfew mm-hmm. so that go people go party. Let let no one lie to you that uh, there's anything else. It, it has nothing to do with the economy because people have been surviving for the last three years, uh, for the last three months. It has to do with the because people are open, uh, are willing, to, are waiting for the opening mm. so that Buku Rasema ni me miss You know, ni me miss movement life, from man. Nairobi to, mm. eh? Yes. Thank you, Matthew. You're most welcome. Mary in Kisi. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, how are you? Fine. We are fine. Well, you. thank you. Mary, are we ready, yes, are we ready to say? reopen? No, we are not ready. Hmm. But I can say our government is very corrupt. Like <laughs> somebody recently traveled from Netherlands to Kisi mm-hmm. on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, through, I don't know, fight they call fate. Mm-hmm. Uh. So they are the ones who are infecting us. Somebody yeah, landed in Kenya from the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh. And it was like, where are you so that we can meet? <laughs> <laughs> so I told him I'm in Nairobi. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so, so the first of all, so they, they go to the country. Wow. Yeah. Of course, that is JKIA. Mm. Yes. And then they cross the restriction barriers uh, that restrict people from leaving the Nairobi metropolitan region. They came all the way to Kisi. Yeah. And they were asking to meet you. Yes. So we are not ready. Clearly. <laughs> we are not ready. <laughs> they are going to infect us and our kids. Wow. Thank you, Mary. Dennis in a hero. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Good are we morning. are we ready to reopen? Mm, okay, myself. What I would like to say is that mm. uh, this is something. This is a pandemic that uh, affected uh, the entire globe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have to do some comparison with other countries. If they are uh, ready, uh, then uh, we also measure uh, the strength that we are having in coming the the, the the spread of the disease in case uh, we open up. Mm-hmm. Uh, you heard that uh, the president was telling all the counties to put some measures in place. Yep. And uh, in fact, what I, I would like to say is that uh, some of the counties have not reached the, 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 the required uh, number of beds that were supposed to be given. Mm-hmm. So it means that we are still not very much ready. Uh, that in case we open up, then uh, if it happens that uh, maybe the counties can be infected. Mm. We won't be in a position of coming up with the disease or, 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 or coping up well with the disease. Okay. Thank so you. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Let's hear from uh, Goge in Likoni. Good morning, Goge. Good morning. How are you? Fine, thank fine. You. fine, thank you. I, I, I like your, your conversation. Asante. And, and I'm calling uh, from Likoni, just near the ferry. Mm-hmm. I, I would like to say that I think uh, we need to reopen. Hmm. Yeah, because uh, we, we, we move. I, I have some interest in Nukunda. Mm-hmm. And uh, I usually go and give the police a hundred bob. And then, then I, I, I go do my business, then I come back. So you're tired of spending these hundred shillings? Ah, I'm tired. Mm, that's the problem. Yeah, and it's, and it's like, it's only the people who have cars who have problems. Why must you go to Nukunda, Goge? Uh, I, I, I said I have some business. Mm-hmm. I have a rental house and I have to make sure that it is uh, in good shape. Mm-hmm. Because that's where I'm getting my income from. Mm-hmm. So why should wh- why should I be kept in Mombasa and yet I um, have no business in Mombasa? Yeah, we, we should be allowed to move. But then uh, we should not... Uh, we should still keep the whatever... What did you mean when you said that only people who have cars have a problem? What I mean is, when I go to the Mombasa Kuala border, yes, they are, you see people being dropped, walk across to go and be picked by vehicles <coughs> to Ukunda. Mm. And those from Ukunda are dropped at a place called Ngombeni. Mm. They cross to what you call Shikadabu mm-hmm. on, on foot. Yep. And then they come to Mombasa and do their business and go back. They are never stopped. Hmm. So you want it to be reopened, bottom line. Yeah, we should, we, we should reopen. So, so what you're saying is that the, in real sense, it's already it's, open. It's open anyway. 
it, it's already open. I don't. It's only people who have cars who have problems. Leave These your are car. People who are being stopped. Leave your car, Gogi. I leave my car. Mm. Yes. Ah, mm. uh, for convenience. I need. I need. I need convenience. Okay. Walk, walk from Gombeni to Shikadabu. Yes. Or from Shikadabu to Gombeni. Uh, and uh, use the same method. That way, you will not need to pay a hundred bob. Then, but I still have to pay on the other side. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank yes. you, thank you, Google. Let's hear from Robert in Kisumu. Good morning. Morning, Eric. How are you? Mzuri sana. Morning, City. Good morning. Morning, Duoko. Good morning. Now, my 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 issue here is, you see, when we locked down this country, we had very few cases. Mm. There were less than a hundred. Yeah. Now we are doing more than 5,000 cases. Yep. What is the government strategy? W what are they doing differently that will make us open up this country? Mm. Because, you see, if, if we had a strategy like we have a serious reporting system mm. that every, every county now can easily report the cases that they have, and we have a clear strategy of how each case can be reported directly to the national government and a response team that will come to their aid just like immediately, then you'd probably have a strategy on how we are going to exit this. Now, if you look at it again, in terms of, uh, let's say, what else do you need that you can't get? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the level that we have, because our guys are not adhering to containment measures, so, so there is no way that we are going to curb this thing if we open up our economy right now. I don't think we are ready to open up mm -hmm. our country. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Oh, Carl Martin. Yes, morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, about the opening of the country mm. Mm. or the economy, uh, it should not be uh, open. Why? Because it has uh, already opened. It should be officially <laughs> open. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're saying there are no restrictions anyway. Ah, no, no restriction. So we, we we just need some formal communication from the president that this thing uh, was open a long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you should move on with the life. Okay. Oh, Carl, have you yeah. traveled to Nairobi recently? <laughs> uh, traveling to Nairobi, of course, I, I have not, but my friends have... Uh, Successfully travel. They have come and, and, and come back to Kisumu. Yeah, successfully. And they are feeling well. <laughs> okay. So basically, from where you sit, there is nothing about opening or reopening. It's just a formal statement that needs to be made by yeah, the president. Yeah, just a formal statement to be made by the president. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Martin. Yes. Yeah. 26 to 10, this is the Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation, 0719-012600. The question we're asking this morning is, are we ready to reopen? Are we ready for easing up of the restrictions that are in place as interventions to fight COVID-19? The president should be making an announcement on Monday, the 6th of July. He gave us 30 days. They expire on that day. What should we expect to hear from the president? Let's take a look at traffic and then we pick your calls. Okay, Langata is a parking lot this morning. Langata Road, rather, is a parking lot. Trying to get downtown is going to be quite something. And this traffic has started about half an hour ago. It was not this way earlier. We're likely to see that because of what happened on the Southern Bypass, all traffic now coming in this direction has been made worse. Mombasa Road are looking a little bit better, not as bad as it was about 30 minutes ago either. And it's looking smooth on Thicker Road. You've done well for yourself this morning. Traffic hour lasted only about an hour and a half. We'll see that this will open up quite swiftly. And that's what it looks like on the roads right about now. Traffic.
for example, the counties that have come up with serious measures to contain uh, the spread of COVID-19. Mombasa, right? Yes. We had seen very many of those measures. Now, recently, the Hassan Joho government uh, released some of these conditions and said businesses like eateries, hotels, restaurants, guest houses, barber shops, salons and spas, indoor games and sports, as well as sellers of secondhand clothing, that's Mitumba, are free to operate according to the Mombasa County COVID-19 Emergency Response Committee. This includes the county uh, leadership, which is the county government leadership, uh, and as well as the county commissioner, who is also uh, is part of this committee. They said, all right, so you will not be able to leave the Mombasa County, go into Kuala, go into Kilifi, go into um, Teta Taveta, and further into Nairobi if you want to. Operating within, Nairo within uh, Mombasa County, you run a barber shop, it's okay, open, observe all these measures. They've come up with a clear guidelines on what they expect mm -hmm. when they are doing the inspections this is what we expect you to do but live and let live same thing truth be told is happening everywhere else in the country barber shop go to a barber shop get your haircut whatever you want whatever you want go to market you operate in the market as long as you're observing these Avoid measures uh, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> wear a mask outside and inside actually they <laughs> seem to observe those rules very very strictly mm. At least in the barber shop I went to yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Full time. Mm. You must have your mask oh, on. Oh, they have their mask on and they, they, are, they ask you to also have your mask on. Mm. And and uh, sanitization and everything. Everything. As is you there. enter. Yes. So the economy is open. What do you expect the president to tell us? Now you can walk around at, at midnight. What for? <laughs> what, what are you doing at yeah, midnight? What for? Mm. Let's go to the phone lines. Very many of them. Paul in Mombasa, good morning. Uh, good morning, Eric. Morning to you, Paul. Are we ready to reopen? Yeah. We are not ready to reopen hmm. for a number of reasons. Right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, actually give kudos to you guys. You are the only station with a ma mature discussion in the morning. Asante sana. We are not ready to reopen hmm. because uh, we are way behind this pandemic. Hmm. Hmm. The steps the government has taken or is trying to take, uh, the announcements, the tracing, they are well, well behind. Far behind, we can't catch up with this thing. Mm. Uh, the strategy we are having is not flexible. It is wrong. Mm -hmm. mm. The only way to move forward is to change the strategy and then reopen. Okay. Uh, the, unfortunate thing, the unfortunate thing we have is that this government is not helping the people. And that's why the people need... Uh, the economy to reopen, whatever the case. Okay. But uh, reasonably, it is not the right thing to do at this point mm. because the leaders, the leaders do not have um, a strategy, a real strategy. What they have had from the beginning went wrong from the onset, and it's still there. And now we are we are running in the wrong direction. Thank you, Paul. Let I, me pick this I, one from uh, Joseph, Doctor Joseph in Kisumu. Good morning. Good morning. How good are morning. You, Very fine, Eric. Dr. are we re ready to reopen? Now, you see, the problem is, what are the thresholds we, we should have to open? That it, what it, should be in place mm -hmm. so that we can open? What, what, will, uh, what will government base on to say now we are ready to open? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll bring to you, uh, I, I want you to look at the research mm -hmm. made by Cambridge Trust. Eh? Mm -hmm. And they were looking at the, uh, Blood, blood donors, donor people who had donated blood, eh? mm -hmm. yep. and they looked at their antibodies of coronavirus, eh? mm -hmm. and they discover like in places in Nairobi, twelve percent of people who had donated blood eh, had actually been contracted the uh, the virus, and they did not know. Mm. So my point is that uh, we should reopen mm -hmm. because if we base on the severity. Of what is happening and in this country yep. Yep. Uh, I don't think there will be so much impact like in the US and the Italy so we should According to the data we have at the we should op we should open the, the economy because for example malaria is killing more people in this country than coronavirus mm. Mm. nobody's talking about that so okay. for now mm -hmm. based on the other uh, for the based on the other indicators like uh, how many people have been infected how many are dead you see. Yeah. So for thank me, you. We thank you, Dr. Open Joseph. Uh, thank oh, you. Thank you. Point made. Raymond in Langata, good morning. Good morning, Derek. Good morning, Indoran City. Good morning. Good morning. 
Yeah, uh, my my, uh, I, I think uh, we we cannot even afford to have uh, another month uh, when the country is, is locked. Mm. Opinion, uh, we actually the country is open already. There's no difference between the, uh, uh, that it's locked or it's open. I think it's just that uh, the president has not formally yeah. opened it. I think. Uh, for me, we are, uh, uh, if, if, if the government then continues with this kind of, 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 of closing, I think they should also provide food for people who are not able to, to go to work. Okay. Paul Kinyanju in Makweni. Yes, good morning to you. Good, good morning. morning. Thank you so much, uh, great people, for the program. Asante. You really educate and inform us. Asante. Are we ready to reopen? Uh, my point of view is that we are not yet ready. Mm. One of the reasons, if you look at uh, most Kenyans, most Kenyans forget too quickly. And there is a tendency of trivializing issues. What have they forgotten? Uh, immediately we reopen, let alone now that people are not obeying the protocols. Mm. You will still find people breaking the rules and copycatting. Mm. So, I think uh, we are in a dilemma, and people in a dilemma, you don't give a second chance. Mm. Yeah, it's not your time to reopen. Mm. Okay. There can't be a trial, there can't be a trial opening. It, it has to be the one. The one, yeah, the one. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Have a good day in yeah. Makweni. Thank you. Thank you to you. Still taking your calls and your opinions on the show, 0719-012600. Are we ready to reopen the economy? Let's take a short break, come out of this break and take you back into what the president said at a point when he extended the measures by a further 30 days. He said he has listened to the experts. Uh, these are scientists, medics, and people who have dealt with them, uh, people who actually also know ep ep epidemi epidemiologists. Epidemiologists. Eh? Epidemiologists. Epidemiologists, mm. right? So those ones... They came and said, we have some irreducible minimums. There were three irreducible minimums. I'm going to give you those three. And then let's look at them and see, have those been met? Are we ready to reopen? Mm. Good morning. FM Nakuru. You okay? You are you ready tuned to hear in the Nairobi's three number one minutes. soul station? I'm gonna read it. Spice like FM. Said, uh, mm -hmm. um, according to the professional standing behind me, the irreducible minimum for lifting the restriction has three thresholds. Mature, one, intelligent talk up, every morning. Spice up yourself and head it downwards. Contained that they headed downwards. The infection. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Our healthcare system must Spice be prepared Nairobi. to take on a surge in infections. It must not be overwhelmed at any one point during the pandemic. Access to testing, isolation, and quarantine must be a bare minimum. Hmm. Is our healthcare system prepared? For if, if we want to use the to beds sufficiently as an, as an take indicator. on a surge. If there was a surge today, if today. Uh, Rashid Aman uh, or Dr. Masi Mwangangi or the CS himself came and said, fellow Kenyans, 1, there were 1,000 new cases tested positive. Are we able to yesterday. handle it? Eric, that Are question can only be responded to by another question. Mm. What does readiness look like? What is, what is, what is this, yes. what is this uh, measure of readiness? Yes, what is it? Let's go into three. Capacity for surveillance and contact tracing must be in place. So the question we must ponder is whether we have met the thresholds in order to lift the restrictions. Have the cases of infections taken a downturn, for instance? That's what the president asked at that time. And he said the answer is no. Nairobi and Mombasa are taking the lead with new infections. Have we met the second minimum of a prepared health system with isolation facilities? I will answer that question by giving you two examples. Siaya, at that point, he said, has 10 bed isolation facility <laughs> and they have already admitted nine 
with only uh, from only one incident. Busia had 34 bed isolation facility and by two days uh, before then, it was already full. So if there was a surge in infections in these two counties, the healthcare system would be overwhelmed. The hard question to pose here, therefore, is whether Kenyans are prepared to nurse COVID-19 patients in their homes if the healthcare system cannot handle the numbers. Are they prepared to expose their children, the elderly, to COVID-19 patients in close proximity of home? Those are the questions the president asked <coughs> on the 9th of June. Mm -hmm. I see him asking the same same questions on the, 6th, on of the 6th of July and the answers will be similar. In June, <coughs> when we were talking about the numbers, mm. I believe we were still at the level of two digits. Yep. Now, mm. we've reached three. So that question, the answer to that question then will be the same answer now except we'll say uh, it has it's beginning to rise alarmingly 30 days ago we were at this number yes. now we are approaching 7000 hmm. very close to 7000 right if anything they're increasing 30 and then days ago by the day per number <coughs> of people tested the right. numbers have significantly increased so if that's the if percentage those were the of positive tests in our sample is now eight in every hundred is rising mm -hmm. uh -huh. that's answer to number one no Answer to number two, still no. no. Are you answer prepared to, number three, still? to do home-based care? Because that's the other thing. If our hospitals are not able to care, take care of, of this, because they're we full. clearly can see, not even because they're full, because we clearly they don't can even see have. they mm -hmm. don't have the bed capacity, our hospitals. That's what they're telling us. Remember the other ailments that take people to hospital? They're still awake, they're of still like there. Take a break mm, and say COVID, for COVID to do mm. its thing. Yeah? Mm. They're still ongoing. Mm -hmm. And right now, with this closeting, there are some diseases that we know of which are clearly airborne, which will have spiked yep. simply because of what it is that we're doing. Yep. And then there's a question of this home-based care, what protocol. does it look like? What is it? Mm, this what, protocol what does it look like? Uh, yeah. Yeah. What must people have? Because when the president says, are you prepared to expose your children and the elderly to people who are posit uh, positive COVID-19 in close proximity? So if... We are talking about home-based care. The first thing that we are saying is we, as we roll out home-based care, we are ensuring that the elderly and the children are not being exposed. Do we have that in place? Do we have the information in place? Do we have the infrastructure in place? Do we have, are we ready to take up uh, this particular uh, home-based care and this particular route? I think also it is important to note that, mm. you know, a couple of the stories that popped out at us over the last couple of days, yep. people who had then been found to be infected with COVID are going to hospital. Understand that we said that previously most of the cases were asymptomatic, and I think that is still the case. However, we're seeing more and more numbers of people getting sick and then being admitted in hospital. Yeah. That means that their symptoms have taken them to the point whereby they are unable to be at home. So and we we've seen a higher more, number of critical have, care people. Exactly. A higher number of critical, uh, those who would be in need of critical care, then being having been found positive and more people then dying. Mm. These stories are coming out. It's possible that more of them are being reported. It is also possible that fewer are being reported and more people have these um, symptoms and are being taken to hospital. You see what I'm saying? Yep. It is very possible that that is the case. Now, if that information is not out there and it's not, freeing fl uh, it's not flowing freely, we've got a problem here. Mm. So and those are the things that should be, re re and those are the things that actually should be taken into consideration. I should ask the question that a number of our callers have asked. Do we have any lockdown here? Got, Are we not open anyway? Didn't you hear uncle who said that he just spends 100 <laughs> shillings and he goes where he needs to go? And he started, his problem is that he's tired of spending the 100 uh, shillings. To, so just open this thing so that we know that I don't have the to barrier. pay anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. Remove the barrier. So has there been a lockdown? And I would say there has been a lockdown in word. Indeed, mm. that's a totally different thing. Mohammed Abdullahi in Mazeras Khalifi, good morning. Good morning to you. How are you? We're fine, thank you, Mohammed. Should we reopen? Are we ready to reopen? First of all, I'd like to appreciate the conversation that is going on today. Yep. Secondly, I would like to say that uh, we, we, we are ready for this thing because there was no lockdown in first place. Because I come from Magenta in Philippi, but what I found in the roadblock mm. uh, is, a, is a bad situation because uh, mostly border borders carry people past the roadblocks without any. Uh, uh, any 
interactions with the police, that is, they diverge the roadblock. Okay. And uh, people go on with their daily calls without any hitch. Therefore, I don't know what is being waited for because uh, everything is going on as usual. And the second thing is... Uh, so it's, 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 it's inconsequential whether the president addresses us on Monday or not. I think, uh, you know, at first when they said that uh, <coughs> it's good for home-based care, yep. this home-based care should be the first thing that you could have done when the cases were very small. Yep. But now the cases are escalating and then you are told that the option is home-based care. So <laughs> we wonder whether this disease is, uh, is really in Kenya or is something that is being built up so that the numbers escalate so that we can still go on on lockdown and curfews for no need because mostly people are hungry people don't have jobs yeah. so we need to go back to normal mm -hmm. thank you Mohammed. as early as possible because if we delay that means that we'll go up to next year while we've not paid rent some of us have not paid rent for the past four months mm. we've not paid for our, our electricity bills water bills so you can imagine when you're jobless and then when it is when you're told that the economy is opened up how will you settle those bills Really, Kabisa. Thank you, Mohammed. Elijah in Nairobi. Hi, how are you guys? We're fine, thank Hi, you. Thank you. So there's a time, I think a month, month and a half ago, mm -hmm. that I pointed out that Magufuli had it right. Mm. Mm. This disease, the attack rate, the morbidity, mortality, remain the same, mm -hmm. whether we do these lockdown measures or not. And the other thing is the decision to get out of lockdown will not be health-based. It will be economic and, by extension, political. Mm -hmm. So that when this thing gets opened up, don't expect for it to get opened up because the numbers are going down. The political pressure will be too much. The economic upheaval is too much. Mm -hmm. So the loss of life will happen. The problem is people don't want to appear to endorse it. Yeah. But it's inevitable. So should should we reopen? Many people have said the country is already open. <laughs> so the issue of should we reopen is a political one. Okay. I'm not a politician, so I'll leave it to the politicians. <laughs> Thank you, Elijah. You have politically dodged that question. <laughs> 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 have a good one. Peter and Kilifi, good morning. Hey, good morning, sir. Uh, good morning to all of you. We will. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just uh, about the opening of this. If we had a definite date when uh, the disease would, uh, would disappear, would come to an end, mm. then we could say until that date. But we do not know for sure, even if, say, for instance, even if we say we'll close until next year, January or February, it's not like, it's not like the disease will end on that, will expire on that day. No. Mm will open there and the disease will still be there. So there is no assurance that uh, our opening our economy would signify the end of the disease. No. So if we can fix it that time, why not fix it now? Let us just go about, go about our business as usual. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, taking care of all the protocols given to us. And, uh, you know, go ahead with our, with our lives. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. What he's saying is what uh, the CS, uh, Dr. Fred Matiangi also said yesterday. Let's find ways of living with this thing. We cannot um, keep running away. Let's find ways of living with this disease, By the way, knowing the measures that we need to put in place. We have not been running away. Mm. No. The whole process of ensuring that people are contained mm. was so that you reduce what would be unnecessary deaths. Mm. And we were going by examples that had been followed elsewhere and which appeared to have produced results. Because, remember, this thing was new. So, just like it caught everybody off guard, it was bound to catch us off guard. True. Now, when <clears throat> you've had people on lockdown and you've observed, yes, you then can change the processes that you've had in place simply because you now understand it better. Yeah. And move to either opening up in installments gradually as... Right. as as the government has attempted to do, mm -hmm. okay? But the this opening up, should it be without these irreducible minimums? Because, again, even when you make political decisions, as the caller Elijah said, mm. even if you make economic decisions, 
the question that then will have to be asked if it isn't asked now it will haunt you later mm. did you make a decision because you thought that human lives do not matter mm. or they are not as important as the economic aspects mm. because what is an economy in the absence of, of the healthy people. healthy, healthy mm. humans so what is it that we expect the president to reopen anyway on monday I don't expect I come from the that president school of to thought where I keep saying that the difference between Kenya and Tanzania is Kenya does very good international public relations statements. And Tanzania? Tanzania just goes out. Just tell you as it is. Yeah, Tanzania, yes. doing... Tanzania did have a lockdown but not of their people. Yeah. They had a lockdown of information. Mm. Yeah. So, they keep it to themselves. They, they had restrictions. They had restrictions for a number of things in the economy. For example, you know, the many schools, many schools and, and yeah. gatherings and and all and sporting activities had all been banned, all right? But then the president was opened up all those things. In this country, as you can hear, yes, we have the restriction of movement from two counties and these are the ones that have the highest numbers, yes. But within the county there's a lot of movement. Mm. So we're talking about 3 million people who live in Nairobi, but they can interact freely. Now, 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 now. Yes. So, now, so what you're saying, they can interact today. freely now. So <laughs> what can, this thing yeah. of saying that you've locked down, locked down, 3 million people are exposed to this virus. If the numbers, the rate of infection is very high in Nairobi County, mm. then it's very high for 3 million people. Save for the measures that have been put in place and hopefully that some people are following them. That's why you don't have an infection of upwards of, you know, 10,000 people. Mm. Or, you know, uh, that that or the very scary thought that people are walking around with this business anyway and it's just that they have not been tested. Yeah. So, you know, pick it. Either way you want to look at it, it's one or the other. People have been very diligent in making sure that they've washed hands and maintained standards of hygiene and etc. etc. Or, because the fact that it is asymptomatic, Everybody's walking around with COVID and we just don't know. As Professor Nzala put it, the reason why you see these results that we keep proudly talking about as being positive uh. is because of the mitigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Measures that have been put in place, and, people and have And even followed. when we thought that perhaps there wouldn't be a spike, we are seeing it. It's coming now. You know, if you haven't tested a sizable portion of your population, you really can't go around claiming that no. you don't have infection. Now you're okay. No, now we're... No. no. So just don't say it. Just let people be. <laughs> Leave it like that. Yeah, yeah. On paper, we have restrictions. But uh, I oh. told you about Mze and uh, that, that that place where coffee was being smuggled. Chepkube. And my little bird. Mm -hmm. Kip? Kip? Chepkube. Chepkube. <laughs> and my little bird. Mm. Watch yourself. If you're caught, you're, you're on your own. Mm. It's the same thing that's happening now. Just go. Just go. City. Today's proverb. The grasshopper, which was killed by the locust, must be deaf. If you get infected by the virus and you've been told all these wonderful things and you haven't been listening and you haven't been adhering or you believe that so long as you believe it will be so and you don't adhere, you're like the grasshopper. Very much so. Okay. See you tomorrow, folks. It's now 10 o'clock. 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. tomorrow. We'll be right here. Do a call. CTV.